two of the three hearings, uh, the use of Facebook users' data by Cambridge Analytica and the impact on data protection and their consequences. Uh, this is, of course, the second hearing, um, and it's taking place on behalf of uh, the Libe Committee um, and also ETRE, AFCO and Jury Committees. Um, and we're represented here, but there's the other um, chairs are, are kind of coming in and out. We're not sure exactly who, who's coming, but I know that jury is being ably represented here by the vice chair, Maddie Delvo. I know you, Maddie, it's fine. It's just everyone else I'm not sure about. So um, AFCO, I think, will be represented by Miss, Mrs. Hubner, who should be here, and ETRE by Paul Rubig. So uh, it's important that, uh, that all the committees are, are implicated in this hearing. And we will also be joined by, um, I think, the IMCO Vice Chair and I think the Chair of CULT. But um, these are our, our uh, possibilities. Okay, so colleagues, on the 4th of June, we held the first hearing, and um, if you don't mind, I just have to read some boring uh, kind of introductions before we get to the, to the substance of the, of the thing, but it's important because I think on the first hearing, we, uh, we had a very fruitful hearing with um, a good question and answer format. So if you don't mind, we just do the same uh, for this hearing. Again, a very warm welcome to uh, all of our guests who don't normally attend these meetings, and we do expect uh, more members to, to attend um, as they travel in on this Monday. So colleagues, following the decision by the Conference of Presidents on the 12th of April and the meeting with Mr. Zuckerberg um, at the level of Conference of Presidents, um, we decided, um, the Parliament decided to hold uh, three in-depth committee hearings with key interlocutors in the Cambridge Analytica uh, and Facebook scandal. The aim of these hearings was to dig deeper, learn key lessons, and set out the way forward using the EU tools at our disposal. Um, colleagues would have heard that there have been some um, issues with um, securing all of the speakers we wanted, but we have tried uh, between our committees uh, to do our best in this. Um, we um, feel it is crucial to hear from those who are in charge of the departments and hold the relevant positions of responsibility and decision-making. Um, in Facebook and elsewhere, um, and today hopefully we'll, we will hear um, from those guests. Just as a reminder, the second part will focus on specific consequences such as the impact on data protection and privacy, on electoral processes, on trust by consumers and digital platforms, on cyber security, and the market position of social media. Uh, again, as a reminder, on the third part, which will take place on the 2nd of July, we will hear from uh, a number of commissioners about the policy solutions and remedies to ensure similar situations can't happen again. And at that meeting, we've requested Facebook to be represented uh, by Ms. Cheryl Sandberg, the CEO, um, or an alternative. Ladies and gentlemen, let us start today with today's hearing, and we have three very interesting panellists. But before that, I'd like to remind you of the rules we'll uphold for this hearing and the Q&A session, uh, which was successful last time. So if we could please stick to this and the timings, please, um, rigorously. Um, prior to the meeting, the political groups agreed to allocate slots for questions for each session, 15 questions each, according to the Daunt system. So everything is fairly... Uh, planned on that basis um, and after each question uh, we ask the, the guests to give an answer to keep the up the pace of the hearing and the interest level of the hearing after the presentations um, by the panel I'm going to give the floor to the chairs of the committees concerned um, and after which we will then follow the established speakers list um, each member on the speaker's list, um, as well as the chair of the associate committees, will ask a single question directed to a single panelist. So you have to say who it is uh, you're asking the question to. Uh, you, you're going to do that for a maximum of one minute. The panelist to whom the question was addressed to will have two minutes to respond, and we have to stick strictly to that time limit. Anyone who exceeds the time limit will unfortunately be cut off. In case the member on the list is not present, the following speaker will give be given the floor automatically. So I think that's all very obvious. So I think um, 
we can now proceed to the speakers. So that wasn't as long and as boring as I thought it was going to be. So now we come to the, um, to the speakers and we have a panel. Um, Andrea Jelinek, Chair of the EDPB and Austrian DPA. Uh, Paul Olivier De, De Haya, um, President and Co-Founder of PersonalData.io and Steve Satterfield, Director for Pri Privacy Policy and Head of Advertising Policy in the Public Policy Team at Facebook. Um, we're going to start now with session one um, and we start with the, the question list. So, um, we start with the speaker first. So, I give the floor first to... Um, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, because we're open and democratic <laughs> and... It's not necessary. You can, you can do it. Yeah. No, I, I'm just going to invite, because it's the European Parliament and we've got to do this, um, I'm going to invite the... Um, chairs and um, vice chairs etc of other committees if they want to say anything Mary, do you want to say something quickly uh, thank, thank you Claude so I, I, I am here to represent the committee on legal affairs and our committee primarily looks at questions relating uh, to the case from the perspective of jurisdiction questions applicable, applicable legislation and the question of which court is competent to hear complaints and then, of course, the interpretation and application of international law, ethical questions related to uh, new technologies, text and data mining, in particular, as far as intellectual property rights are concerned. So on behalf of Yuri, I would therefore also like to welcome the experts here today. And I hope that this will be an open and constructive discussion on in particular jurisdiction issues which will help in understanding what happened in this case and what redress possibilities are available in order to avoid this happening again. So I think I will be very short and we should start immediately with the panelists. You're always very brief and to yes. the point, Maddie. That's good. And 10 out of 10 for jury for turning up. Um, maybe when the other committee chairs, vice chairs, whatever turn up, they might want to say something. That's good. Okay, but for the time being, we start the hearing and we begin uh, by giving the floor to the first speaker, who is Andrea Jelinek, chair of the EDPB and Austrian DPA, for, uh, for up to 10 minutes, please. Please go ahead. Thank you, chairs. Uh, Distinguished members of the parliament, the GDPR entered into application on May 25th, as you all know, and entered already into force two years ago. With the GDPR, the ETPP, the European Data Protection Board, a new independent body of the EU was created, put together by the data protection authorities of the EU, the ETPS and the Commission, as body with decision-making powers. Cambridge Analytica Facebook case is investigated by the ICO in the United Kingdom because Cambridge Analytica was based in the UK. And if the case would have occurred on or after May 25th, the ICO would be the lead authority and the other DPA concerned authorities. The ICO would draft the decision and share this uh, with the other concerned DPAs. And uh, at the end, there could be fines up to 4% of the company's sales. But as this uh, case occurred before the enter into application of the GDPR, the ICO is not only the leading authority, the ICO is the investigating authority, and the ICO will be uh, the own authority issuing a report. But the ICO is keeping us posted all the time and we are in strong cooperation with the ICO. And uh, the investigations have been made and the results are going to be published, I think, in June or July in the report. One of the core issues of the GDPR is, as you all know, accountability. And the companies here at Facebook have to show their compliance with the rules and that they are accountable. In the past, the balance lopsided and the GDPR is giving individuals back the control over their personal data. The GDPR cannot solve problems of this, of this cause, 
but we have stronger tools than we had before. Data protection didn't fall from sky on May 25th. The Data Protection Directive entered into force more than 20 years ago. If you have been compliant from that date on, to be compliant with the GDPR won't be a problem. Companies have to gain back the trust of their users, partners, customers. If you are compliant with the GDPR, it's not only a unique selling proposition, it is necessary according to the law. If you invest in data protection in advance, e.g. privacy by design, privacy by default, and if you take responsibilities as a controller serious, your accountability, you don't have to invest money afterwards in advertising campaigns, in apologizing and saying you are sorry, which is definitely not enough. EDPP, as we already, as we already have more than 30 cross-border cases at the moment, we are going to investigate very carefully according to the rules of the GDPR, the consistency mechanism, the lead supervisory authority and the concerned supervisory authorities are there afterwards. Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, I think is just the peak of the iceberg, like many others said before, but I have to rely on that. What really is concerning is that there are revelations and then Facebook admits having shared data of users and even non-users. And after each revelation, they admit another thing. It is like a puzzle and we don't know how many pieces are in there and how many are still missing. Data protection is a fundamental right which has to be respected and granted and the DPA are supporting the individuals in enforcing their rights. It's not, a, it's not a question if somebody is misusing data, he should not even have because there is no consent or no law to get this data. You still are not allowed to process if the user didn't give his consent freely. Data protection is going mainstream. As, as we read last week, Wall Street Journal is hosting a debate if the US should adopt a legislation similar to the GDPR this is really very interesting because it's really the first time that the awareness is raised in the U.S. and the citizens are really concerned about the use of their data. Interests from many parts of the world regarding the GPR, GDPR are arising and Europe is setting the pace. And also U.S. companies are not only trying to be compliant as they have to be, they follow and they always and they Awareness is already increasing for data protection and, as you see, from the U.S. citizens too. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now we go straight to Paul Olivier de Hay, President and Co-Founder of Personal Data I. Io. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address such a prestigious assembly. It truly is an honor for me. I myself came to the Cambridge Analytica story simply as a citizen with some knowledge of data protection rights. In December 2015, I read an article by Harry Davis in The Guardian. It made clear that a UK company had processed personal data, political data, on hundreds of millions of Americans. Immediately, I saw the potential for this situation to generate fruitful discussions on data protection matters, particularly across the Atlantic. When I didn't see any follow-up articles in The Guardian, I started investigating on my own. I quickly gathered a lot of evidence that was very concerning. The importance felt even greater in light of the social media dynamics during Brexit and the US presidential elections. Or rather, because of the disappointing press coverage of those dynamics while the elections were taking place. I went to journalists with my evidence and some of the Cambridge Analytica coverage blossomed from this in many successive stages. At each stage, over a couple of years, I watched, I watched in amazement as Facebook's PR skillfully deflected accusations that I knew to be true. This worked out well for them until at least March 2018. Some have summarized that period by saying that Facebook is simply Cambridge Analytica with better PR. There is definitely something true to this statement, as indeed much of what Cambridge Analytica tried to do Facebook also does on a routine basis, except that until recently, they didn't get much heat for it. 
In any case, I'll call this type of coverage, of price coverage, top-down transparency, as from a data protection standpoint, it does not actually involve a single data subject. So, what would bottom-up transparency look like? Well, it's certainly much harder at the moment, but it shouldn't be. The goal is ultimately for individuals to understand how their information ecosystem is shaped. So why not make sure their questions that legally have to get an answer actually receive a proper answer? In the case of Cambridge Analytica, you heard in the first session Professor David Carroll present his subject access request and the consequences in terms of litigation in the UK. Regarding Facebook, I started my own slew of subject access requests back in December 2016. I asked Facebook for access to my custom audience's data and my pixel data. From the advertiser's viewpoint, custom audiences allows them to target groups of individuals for whom they have a phone number, an email address, or similar information. After some insistence, Facebook did release a tool enabling any user to have the opposite view into the advertisers who have that information. Facebook, however, arbitrarily, completely arbitrarily, limited this tool to a time scope of two months, which made it useless in retroactive investigations of dynamics during past elections. Nevertheless, even with this limited scope, it is shocking to many users to see a list of hundreds of advertisers pretending to Facebook they have their consent. Many journalists, including in the top journals, choose to lead their articles with this information when discussing the extent of Facebook's surveillance. My other request concerned pixel data. This should basically contain the list of pages of Facebook on completely different websites where I've been tracked by Facebook. This could be very informative as well, even retroactively, in understanding dynamics during electoral periods. 18 months later, I still haven't received that list. But these specific efforts have by now led to a question to Facebook's CTO in the UK Parliament, to Mark Zuckerberg in the European Parliament, and two comments from Mark Zuckerberg in the US Congress. All the responses provided by these Facebook executives are in fact contradicted by responses I had myself obtained previously. This was explicitly pointed out by US Senator Blumenthal in direct written questions to Mark Zuckerberg. In turn, Facebook's response to this direct request is to announce some vague plan to implement a new feature called Clear History. We might hear about that feature very soon. That feature, by its very design, will be highly deficient on the day of its eventual launch, at a still unspecified point in the future. There's also no doubt this feature will be presented as voluntary rather than the mandatory transparency effort for which I have started calling out Facebook 18 months ago. It's worth noting that I was initially making those requests through Privacy Shield, since there I had at least, in theory, a chance to argue my case for free in front of an independent third party called Trustee. However, after a while, Facebook talked to, tr talked to Trustee and figured out how to dismiss my complaints at their very start. I just had to interact with the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, who has not taken a single proactive step in enforcing the law with respect to my complaints. Quite the contrary, actually. There's no mild way to put this. In my view, shared by many, the Irish data protection did, sorry, in my view, shared by many, the Irish data protection commissioner's office has been the biggest enabler in Facebook's sustained disregard for European laws regarding data protection. So Facebook is really Cambridge Analytica with better PR, better lawyers, and even better lobbying. In the end, all this is very unfortunate. I'm not pursuing transparency for the sake of transparency. I'm pursuing it to better understand how these systems work and to educate others to these digital issues. I founded a nonprofit working on this, personaldata.io, and we have formulated a strategy for enforcement as it relates to platforms. It's a bit subtle, so I will leave that strategy to additional written testimony submitted to the committee. Ultimately, Facebook's data is key to identifying and solving the problems they have themselves created. Facebook itself is not necessarily that key. 
while Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg will offer apologies and ask, us, ask from us for even more trust while they fix things based on this data, they will really be cementing even more power over an information ecosystem they actively pollute. As an alternative, a lot of this data could be copied outside of Facebook through the portability right. And additional services could be constructed there, offering a healthy counterbalance to Facebook's power. The Facebook pixel data, for instance, could be imported into an information dietitian that would advise the user on the diversity of opinions they are exposed to. It could also be entrusted to journalists trying to understand better foreign influence. This innovation is actively stunted by Facebook, and with poor enforcement, it could even be worse down the road. Facebook could give selective access to this data to shape the innovation surrounding their platform, if they're not already doing so, and further their own business goals. I would encourage you to see this portability as pre-distribution. Pre Instead of redistribution through taxes, portability would redistribute opportunity for innovation and rebalance power in the personal data ecosystem. Mark Zuckerberg is denying all of us this opportunity to get access and portability over our data and to build a vast array of services fixing the problems he is actually responsible for. It makes perfect sense. He is currently clinging to an outdated business model. He absol absolutely shouldn't have to be trusted for as long as he does. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we move now straight to <clears throat> Steve Satterfield, Director for Privacy Policy and Head of Advertising Policy at Facebook. Please take the floor for up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Chairs and distinguished members of the Parliament. I'm honoured to be here today. Again, my name is Steve Satterfield. I'm a director on Facebook's privacy team. I'm the person at Facebook responsible for privacy and data protection issues concerning our advertising products, and our app developer platform. I work closely with product managers and engineers to identify and address privacy and data protection issues while we're building our products. Now, Facebook builds products that help people around the world stay connected to the people they care about. Our developer platform helps people connect with other apps and websites in a privacy protective way, embracing the principle of data portability that's included in the general data protection regulation. Now, we're here today to discuss a specific incident related to the Facebook platform. Uh, it is, of course, the violation of Facebook's developer policies that occurred when Dr. Alexander Kogan transferred people's information to Cambridge Analytica. In a moment, I'll, I'll share the steps we're taking to help ensure that what happened with Cambridge Analytica doesn't happen again. However, I also want to take this opportunity to broaden the conversation and speak about Facebook's data protection and privacy practices more generally. And I want to share how we're complying with the GDPR. I also want to address and clear up common misconceptions about Facebook's advertising and data collection practices. Now, uh, many of the issues that we're going to discuss today are about trust. Cambridge Analytica was a breach of trust. It was a breach of trust between Facebook and the people that use our service every day. We're working to earn back the trust of our users by making meaningful improvements to our products, our practices, our internal processes. It's going to take time to work through the challenges that we face, but we're committed to getting it right. We need to get it right. Now, with that, let me turn to the subject of the hearing today, and that's Cambridge Analytica. And let me start by saying that the best information we have suggests that no European user data was shared by Dr. Kogan with Cambridge Analytica. This is backed up by the contracts Dr. Kogan's company, GSR, had with Cambridge Analytica. It's backed up by Dr. Kogan's testimony on the subject. It's backed up by our own internal analyses. Now, we won't be able to uh, conclusively confirm this until we conduct a forensic audit of Cambridge, uh, which we plan to do as soon as we're authorized by the UK Information Commissioner's Office. So it's important to note uh, given this hearing's impact, uh, focus on the impact of Cambridge Analytica on European citizens. But it doesn't diminish the significance of what happened or our commitment to preventing it happening anywhere again. And so what are we doing to help prevent it? Well, the first thing is back in 2014, we changed our policies 
to more tightly restrict the information apps could ask people for, and also to proactively review more apps that were asking for anything more than basic data fields. But now we're going a lot further. First, when you use an app, it will only be able to, uh, to ask you permission for, for limited uh, uh, information, just your name, your profile photo, and your email address, unless it first goes through a full review by our operations team. Second, if you haven't used an app in three months, we'll prevent it from continuing to access your information. Third, uh, in April, at the top of newsfeed, we showed everybody a list of the apps they were using, as well as a simple way to remove permissions for the apps that they didn't want to continue using. And finally, we're investigating every app that had access to large amounts of uh, information before we changed our platform in 2014. Where we have concerns, we'll suspend the app, and where we conclude the data was misused, we'll ban the app completely and tell everyone affected. So far, we've investigated thousands of apps. We've suspended more than 200. But even before we made changes to our developer platform, we were already working for two years to make changes across our services in connection with the GDPR. Now, getting ready for the GDPR has been an enormous effort for Facebook. We created the largest cross-functional team in company history, uh, hundreds of people building new products and experiences, and also seeking feedback from regulators, policymakers, and privacy experts on our approach. Uh, just to give you some examples of the kinds of things we've done, we simplified our controls and settings. So instead of having settings spread across more than 20 screens on Facebook, you can now access them in a single place. We created a new portal for people to, uh, to exercise their rights to access rectification and erasure. And we updated our portability tool, which is called uh, Download Your Information. These tools, by the way, are available to everyone around the world. We built a new user engagement flow asking Europeans for their explicit consent to three types of data processing. It's the collection and use of special categories of personal information on their, pro, uh, their profiles, uh, use of their information for facial recognition, and use of third-party data to show them relevant ads. Now, these features are entirely optional. People can say no to them and still use Facebook. And fourth, we updated our terms and data policy. Our terms are our contract with users, and similar to many services, we ask people to agree to those terms before uh, continuing to use Facebook. And I should say that that agreement is separate from the consents that I just described. Now, our work on data protection and privacy didn't stop on May 25th. To the contrary, we built on the team that we assembled for GDPR, and we've now created a centralized organization that brings together teams from across Facebook to focus solely on privacy in our products. This team's thinking about ways to go beyond compliance and give users more control. As part of this effort, we announced plans to build clear history, which we just heard about. This will let you see the information that Facebook receives from websites and apps when you use them, let you clear this history, and it'll let you stop the information from being associated with your account going forward. Now, when we announced this, it was vague. We, we, we sketched it out in broad outlines, and the reason we did that is because we're hoping to get the feedback from people around the world as we build the tool. Before we go into questions, I want to take a moment to clarify two points about how our service works, and in particular, how our advertising products work. So I want to be clear about what we do and what we don't do. So the first area is advertising. And let me start by being clear, our business model is based on advertising. We think it's the best model to achieve our mission. And the ads people see on Facebook are targeted. That means we use data to personalize the ads people see. Our research has shown that if people are going to see ads, they want to see ads that are relevant to them. And we know that relevant advertising helps businesses reach people that are most likely to be interested in their products, services, and causes. Relevant advertising has been extremely important, especially for small businesses with limited advertising budgets. Advertising and privacy are not in conflict. We can provide relevant ads without telling advertisers who you are or selling your personal data. We also make sure that people can control the ads they see. So as I mentioned earlier, we ask for explicit consent before using third-party data to show relevant ads. We also have a tool called Ad Preferences uh, that enables people to control the interest categories that advertisers can use to show them relevant ads. 
People, people can also see why they're receiving any ad that they're seeing on Facebook, and they can hide future ads from any advertiser. And finally, I want to address another uh, set of questions that have been raised recently, namely about uh, how Facebook processes non-Facebook users' data and whether we create what some have called shadow profiles. Uh, let me be clear about this. Facebook does not create profiles for people without Facebook accounts. Many websites and apps use Facebook services to make their content and ads more engaging and relevant. These services include our like and our share buttons, as well as tools to make uh, advertising more effective. Facebook login as well. Many other companies offer these kinds of services as well. Now, when you use an app or website that uses our services, we receive information, even if you're logged out or even if you're a non-user. And that's because the app or website doesn't know whether you're a Facebook user or not. We do require websites and apps to tell you they're collecting and sharing people's information with us and to get their permission where that's required before they do so. We use this information for several purposes, and I'm happy to discuss in detail during the questions, but we don't create shadow profiles of anybody. That's simply false. I'll end with this. Data privacy is at the core of our business. As our CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, has said, if we can't protect people's data, we don't deserve to serve them. What happened with Cambridge Analytica, the Cambridge Analytica matter has provided an opportunity for us to reconsider uh, the ways in which our developer platform works. And the GDPR has been, over the past few years, further impetus for us to consider the ways in which we're protecting data across all of our services. We believe we've made meaningful improvements to our practices, but we recognize that we have more work to do. Again, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we go straight to the questions. It's a one-minute question and a two-minute answer. The list, um, again, has been meticulously um, organized by De Haunt. There is one substitution where one member will be asking two questions. This was agreed before the meeting uh, because um, one member could not uh, be here. And this is a straight group for group substitution. And this is the only uh, variation to the list which was agreed before the meeting. Otherwise, it's um, set out um, by the groups. And we begin first with the jury vice chair, Maddie Delvo, uh, for one minute, please. Uh, thank you. My question goes to Mr. Satterfield. So uh, you explained uh, or gave some uh, information on what Facebook is doing now to protect the uh, data of the users, and you insisted on Europeans. So uh, do you apply the same policy uh, to citizens from other uh, continents? Or is it an, 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 a policy for the European Union? And uh, uh, looking back, what measures can, have you taken to provide easy access to justice for users who have suffered damage? Uh, and how does this action differ between the different jurisdictions in which those users are based? Thank you for your question. I, I think your first question was, are, are we providing the similar protections uh, in Europe that we're providing around the world? And the answer is yes, we're, we're providing the same settings and controls for everyone around the world. Uh, now, you know, Facebook Ireland is the data controller for, for people in Europe. Facebook Inc. is the data controller for people outside of Europe. Uh, we recognize that the, the G, uh, GDPR is a law that was uh, created by Europeans and that reflects the unique history and culture of Europe. We also recognize that there are countries outside of Europe that have emerging data protection frameworks as well that reflect their unique histories and cultures, and we want to be responsive to those. Uh, I think your second question was, what are we doing to be responsive to people uh, who have feedback on our service? First of all, that's, that's what we're built on, is we're built on listening to the people who use our service, but we're also constantly in contact with experts, with policymakers, with regulators, with privacy advocates, and, and we take their, uh, we take their uh, uh, concerns into account when we're building our products. Okay, um, the second question um, is from me as Libe Chair. A few days ago, and um, this is to Mr. Satterfield, a few days ago the New York Times reported that Facebook gave device makers deep access to users' data. Can you indicate how many of these relationships, relationships still persist and why, if they still persist? Secondly, if Cambridge Analytica displayed targeted ads on Facebook, 
Did Cambridge Analytica receive any data from Facebook um, as the result of the targeting? For example, information about users who clicked or viewed on ads, and if so, what type of information? And third, on which platforms were users targeted by political adver advertisements as the result of the profile created by Cambridge Analytica, either on Facebook, on other sites, or on both? Thank you for that question. Uh, I, I think the first question was about some reporting in the New York Times from a couple of weeks ago about partnerships that we have uh, with device makers, with operating system makers um, that we've partnered with in order to help provide Facebook and Facebook-like experiences on their devices and operating systems. It, it's important to understand what these relationships were and how they're different from the relationships we have with third-party app developers. And so uh, you have to think about the, uh, the time in which these partnerships were, were started. It was uh, around 2008, 2010, uh, when the mobile ecosystem looked a lot different than it does today. So most of us go online from our phones using Google's, I uh, Google's Android operating system or Apple's iOS. You download the Facebook app uh, from an app store and you can use Facebook directly there. It wasn't always the case. Uh, you know, in around 2010, there was a multiplicity of different devices and operating systems out there. Uh, Blackberry, Palm, Sy the Symbian operating system that, that worked on Nokia phones. A huge range of different ways of going online from your phone. Facebook was, was still a, a relatively new company, and we couldn't <coughs> build Facebook apps for all of these different uh, devices and operating systems, and so we partnered with other companies to help them bring Facebook or Facebook-like experiences to their users. Um, I think the question was how many of these partnerships have persisted. Uh, I, th I think that there were, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, roughly 55 or 60 of them. Uh, we are winding them down, as we announced in April, because iOS and Android have become the dominant ways in which people use Facebook today. I think we've wound down around half of them now, and we plan to, to wrap up al almost all of them uh, by the end of the year. Um, I think the next question was about uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, running ads and, and whether an advertiser gets information uh, about people after when they run an ad campaign. Uh, again, you know, we, Cambridge Analytica, to the best evidence that we have, didn't, didn't get Europeans' information. Now, Cambridge Analytica is an ad company, and if they ran ads on Facebook, they would get what other advertisers get, which is an aggregate report back about things like how many people clicked on ads, uh, uh, the, the general demographic breakdown of those people, how many people saw their ads for billing purposes and for, for general insights purposes. Um, and uh, I think the last question was on, on, on what sites uh, would Cambridge Analytica have uh, have advertised? I mean, uh, you know, again, they're an advertiser. They they could have advertised on our services, Facebook and Instagram, or our, our main services that show ads. Okay, um, you did overrun, but it was my questions. <laughs> um, okay, third is uh, Roberta Metzola, um for one minute from the EPP and Libe, please. Thank you. Well, let me start with a not so popular opinion. I'm actually a fan of Facebook, and I believe that it has largely been and can continue to be a force for good because I come from a country where the vast majority, a massive percentage of the population is actually a regular user. But there have been inherent weaknesses, and this is for you also, Mr. Satterfield, um, and our Facebook platform um, has to address such weaknesses. Um, we know that data has been harvested by firms like Cambridge Analytica in cases like the US election and the Brexit referendum. We know of thousands of uh, people from my country, Malta, whose uh, data and that of millions of others, EU citizens, was misused. So concretely, how can we ensure, and I haven't really heard this um, uh, in all the debate we've had, that this will not happen again, uh, that people's private information is safe on your network, and what is being done to support bona fide news sites that feed traffic to Facebook, but who then themselves fall victim of your reporting mechanisms by organized trolls who report unfavorable news as fake. Thank you. Uh, to, to the first point about you know, uh, Cambridge Analytica affecting the, the, the Brexit or the EU referendum, again, I would uh, just reiterate that the best evidence that we have is that Cambridge Analytica didn't receive information from European users. 
Um, uh, but, but to your second question, I mean, what, what kinds of things can we do uh, to prevent the misuse of our tools in connection with elections? Uh, Mr. Kaplan is going to address this uh, shortly, but, but let me just you know, give you a, a couple of things. Um, the first, first thing I think is one that you, you pointed out, which is that a lot of the misuse of our tools comes from people who are trying to conceal their identities on Facebook. They're using fake accounts. You know, the Russian interference in the 2016 election, those ads came from fake accounts. And so many of the efforts that we're making around election integrity are focused on, on tamping down on fake accounts, and we're doing better than we ever have. Thanks largely to uh, advances in AI and machine learning, we can identify these accounts uh, many times at the moment they're created. We block uh, something like a couple of million fake accounts every day. We're blocking 500 million a quarter at this point. Uh, we're also cracking down on the spread of false news. Nobody wants false news on Facebook. We certainly don't, and we know our users don't. And so some of the things we're doing, we're working with third-party fact checkers, and when we find that uh, news has been reported as false, we've downranked that. We can reduce the number of views by something like 80%. Uh, we're also penalizing clickbait and sensationalism, which is often what false news is. And we're disrupting the economic incentives around false news. And so we're taking action against websites that try to use our advertising tools to make money when they're purveyors of false news. Uh, so fake accounts, false news, adds transparency. I mean, I, again, a lot of these actors are trying to use our ads tools to spread misinformation. Um, we think the best way to deal with that is to shed light on their efforts. And so later on this week, we're going to announce that we're rolling out view ads globally. And view ads is a feature that you'll be able to see all of the ads running from a particular page uh, uh, by going to that page. And so we think these efforts are the, are the best ways uh, uh, to, to help tamp down on the, on the issues you're talking about. I was, I was the first to breach the time limits, but can we, let's try and keep it to one minute and two minutes because we have another session as well. I was the first to, to, to breach it, sorry for that. Next is Birgit Sippel uh, from the SND and Libe, please. Thank you, and sorry, it's once again a question to Mr. Satterfield. The terms and conditions of the This Is Your Digital Life app, we have heard this, actually stated quite clearly that the data collected could be sent to other parties. So Facebook knowingly went into a contract with an app developer that openly announced that they reserved the right to disclose personal data to third parties. And can you explain how this was in line with the relevant EU data protection law at the time? In addition, how can you explain that it's also okay not to only send the data of that very person using the app, but also of all the friends that never gave consent to everybody? And allow me a last statement, advertisement is affecting privacy because it's possible that's what we saw that you can be individually manipulated with all the data. So there is a link different to what you said between advertisement and affecting privacy. Thank you, Ms. Zippel, for those questions. Uh, first, yes, the, the, the privacy policy for Dr. Kogan's uh, application uh, did seek consent to share data beyond uh, uh, its app. Um, what I would say is that um, our terms apply notwithstanding what any developer might disclose in its privacy policy. That is to say, you cannot override our policies by putting something in your own. And our policies clearly prohibited what Dr. Kogan did with the data in, in, in giving um, users uh, data to Cambridge Analytica. He violated our policies when he did that, a number of our policies, including policies that prohibited selling data uh, and, and transferring data to advertising and monetization firms. Um, your question about friends data. At the time when, when Dr. Kogan's app was on our platform, uh, you know, we did enable app developers to access or to ask people's permission to access friends data. We thought this was an important way of helping people bring their networks with them to other apps so that apps could build social experiences which is the purpose of Facebook's developer platform. But we heard feedback from a number of people uh, for some time that we should disable this feature, and we did uh, in, in 2014 when we changed our platform. 
Um, you know, we've, we've heard from a number of people recently that, that they wish that it were easier to reconstitute their friends' network outside of Facebook, and those are, those are questions that we're hearing around the data portability question, uh, and they're questions that we'll continue to, to consider. And lastly, on your point about advertising affecting privacy, uh, of course it does. Of course it does. Uh, Any time you're using personal data for any purpose, you have to consider privacy. Uh, we think that we do a lot to ensure that there's transparency around the ads that they run, we run, and that people have control. Thank you. Dan Dalton, ECR, Lee Bay and Imco, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, sorry, Mr. Satterfield, but I'm also going to ask you a question. Now, we hear a lot here about how concerned people are about their privacy here in Europe. And given the nature of this scandal, which is misuse of personal data, I'd be keen to know what the practical impact of this is on consumer trust in Facebook itself. So I'd be keen to know, first of all, have your revenues dropped in Europe since the scandal? And secondly, how many European users have left Facebook and actively closed their accounts uh, since the scandal? Uh, I'd be keen to know numbers, please. Well, we shared numbers on both of these at the end of our first quarter, and those are the numbers that I could share today. Uh, and I think that they were both very positive numbers. We'll, of course, continue to comply with any applicable disclosure requirements around monthly active people and our revenue. And uh, I think that we report shortly again, and we'll see. Um, Axel Voss, EPP, Libe. Please, thanks. Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Thank you very much, Chairman. I had a question for Mrs. Elinek, but I wanted just to say clearly. One, okay, it's number two. Okay, one. Carry on, that's. Um, that's, that's uh, so I just wanted to say that I have the feeling that uh, I don't think uh, more rules can stop people circumventing the GDPR. I think what we actually need is more controls. I mean, I don't quite know how that should work, but uh, you know, there's no point in having uh, rules and then you know saying you shouldn't do this and then people do it anyway and so you just have more rules in place. So has the uh, agency actually dealt with that issue and what are the results? I mean if you have looked at that as an issue, what were the results? What do you think about uh, ensuring that controls can be improved in the future? Thank you for the question. So the European Data Protection Board has met once, and the next meeting, well, the board has only just been set up uh, since the 25th of May, and so the next meeting will be on the 4th and the 5th of July. And so in advance, in Article 20, the Article 29 group, we've uh, worked on many different to topics to do with controls. But the, at the European level, with this, uh, this body which will be authorized to make decision, we've only just started, 25th of May. And so we're going to... Uh, consider these questions, what kind of controls will be carried out, and not just to be re reactive, but also to be proactive. But up until now, we had 29 cross-border cases, which we have loaded onto our shared system and which are being investigated at present. But independent of uh, cases which are being driven by complaints, we are also going to be active. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Gomez uh, for the S&D and Libby, please. To Mr. Satterfield as well. Um, Cambridge Analytica Associate SCL Elections Limited, a UK company uh, dealing with elections, uh, interfered uh, in elections in the Caribbean and in some cases even using private data on uh, leaders of opposition parties. It was, for instance, the case in St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, do you have any uh, information on whether these were data uh, harvested uh, in Facebook? And then uh, recently in a letter dated uh, 
June 13, Global Privacy NGO Access Now urged Facebook to submit to an external audit. We haven't heard any reply from Facebook. Will you commit to accept a truly independent external audit of your data practices? If not, please explain why. I, I noticed that you mentioned uh, a forensic audit submitted to uh, authorization by the UK. Why uh, in that particular case? And uh, thank you. Thank you for your questions, Ms. Gomez. Um, uh, regarding SCL's practices in St. Kitts and, and Nevis, I'm, I'm not aware of what those practices may have been. Um, obviously, uh, it, it's concerning what you say, but I'm not, I'm not familiar with those allegations and can't speak to them. Um, with respect to your question about submitting to an external audit, I would say that, that Facebook is regularly audited, both by an independent auditor in the U.S. and we've been audited by the Irish Data Protection Authority, I think, two or three times, and the results of those audits are public uh, from the, data, uh, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. Um, we are going to continue to work very closely with the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, and I know that they are scrutinizing our practices very carefully, uh, particularly now that the GDPR is in force, uh, and we expect that, that scrutiny to continue and, and to be tough. Uh, the same thing with uh, the FTC in the U.S., uh, which, of course, requires us to go and undergo uh, biennial audits. Okay, Sophie Interfeld for Audi and Liebe, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I mean, uh, it's very interesting to, to listen to Facebook, but I think it's a bit strange to be sitting here and asking them, you know, if they wouldn't mind uh, sort of respecting the laws if it's not too much trouble. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm deeply touched by your commitment to privacy, but I would prefer to actually rely on the laws but also the bodies that are there to enforce the laws. And I keep wondering why it took so long before the data protection authorities started to move. And I'm glad to hear you say that from now on you will also be operating in a proactive manner um, because this is, um, you know, and uh, like Roberta Metzola, I think Facebook is also has, has very positive sides, so let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, but you're up against a formidable force. So do you have enough capacity? And do you actually, do the DPAs, have they already mentally adjusted to the new situation? What are you going to do to make sure that this doesn't happen again? And in those rare cases where it turns out that Facebook, you know, is not as committed to privacy as we were just told, that you will be there to enforce the European law and protect our rights. Your multi-layered contribution can only go to one person, so who, who is it? it goes to Madame yes, Madame. sorry, to okay. Ms. Jelinek. Thank you, Frau Abgeordnete, for the Frage. Uh, Thank you very much indeed for that question. All governments um, did actually increase staff numbers ahead of changes. And uh, the, in truth, not all of the data supervision authorities had the right number of additional staff added, but um, that's an ongoing process. And when it comes to GDPR, it, you know, we're trying to adapt, and that's where you need to ensure that there is a lead authority, an authority that actually takes the lead and involves all stakeholders uh, to contribute so that not, they're not just um, allowed to participate but they can in come forward with real concerns. Now, if some of this isn't actually taken into account then it goes to the board and a decision is taken there. And that was that's something new. We haven't had that before. This cross-border cooperation on the basis of the data protection um, regulation is something new. Before that, we had the Article 29 group, which had an advisory role. The working group uh, actually did issue a lot of guidelines uh, in the past. Yet, for many, many decades it was working on opinions and advising the Commission and the, the governments. But this new um, work of providing binding uh, decisions, that's something completely new and groundbreaking. And we're still, you know, coming, um, getting into this and reaching cruising speed. We can't actually issue uh, penalties 
straight away. We have to follow the procedure um, and be consistent in the way we do that. It, because we need the right level of uh, legal uh, protection to be uh, granted, and that that applies here too. So just give us some time. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos Coelho for the EPP and Libre, please. Thank you, Chair. My question is also to Mr. Satterfield. There are more European users of Facebook than American ones. Mr. Zuckerberg announced that GDPR would be the inspiration to be followed, and you made the reference to that in your speech around the globe, but in practice decided to move most of the users to the U.S. data protection regime. Why did you do that? What are the consequences of this change in your view? And for European citizens, how can you guarantee you are complying with the GDPR? Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. Well, again, I would say that you know, the same settings and controls that apply in Europe apply uh, elsewhere as well, the rest of the world. These are settings and controls that we developed in connection with GDPR, and we've taken those and we've applied them uh, around the world. Uh, I, I think your second question was um, uh, about um, um, what, what guarantees can we give European users that we will comply with the law. Well, I, I, I think that I'm here to say that we are complying with the GDPR, that we've spent two years coming into compliance, but I know that you don't just want to hear me, you want to see it. And so uh, what I would say is that we've, we've got to demonstrate that we're complying by building the tools that are necessary for compliance. You know, I, you know access and data portability, I think, are, are things that maybe we aren't talking enough about right now, but we have invested huge amounts in securing those rights uh, around the world. But of course, those are inspired by concepts from the GDPR. So we build a tool called Access Your Information, uh, which is a single surface where you can go and you can access all of the information you have on Facebook. Download your information, which is our portability tool. Platform is a portability tool as well. Uh, you know, and and, and it's, it, we have limited the information that you can take out of platform in response, uh, in part, to the Cambridge Analytica matter. But, but platform is designed to be a way of taking your information out of Facebook and sharing it with app developers who can create their own experiences. Uh, and so I, I think how are we going to, to demonstrate compliance? We're, we're going to have to demonstrate it by our actions, uh, probably more than our words. Thank you. I explained there are some group um, substitutions. The next, uh, asking the second question is, Maddy Delvo for S and D and Jury. Uh, thank you. Uh, my, my question goes to Madame Zelinek. Um, so uh, you, you mentioned that you have 29 cross-border cases, which I think is maybe many. Uh, so I wanted to. Know, so for the investigations, you have to rely on on the DPAs, <coughs> and I would like to know how this collaboration works, not only concerning. Uh, sufficient uh, human resources, but also the fundamental attitude, keeping in mind what uh, Mr. Uh, De Hays just told us that uh, well, he accused the Irish uh, DPA of not being very friendly to uh, protection of uh, privacy. So uh, how, how, can you, how can you deal with this uh, fundamental divergence positions of DPAs? I had this, a second question, if I may. Do you also, um, um, uh, is, is um, e-privacy regulation also in the competence of, uh, of, uh, your, of the EDPB? Thank you for the frage. Bezüglich der Well, thank you for that question. We're looking at the different uh, viewpoints of the uh, data protection authorities. It's important to say that one of the key points is producing convergence because that's something we want to see. I think that's one of our fundamental tasks actually. We need to come over different points of view and come to a joint way of seeing things, a joint decision. And then ideally this decisions taken unanimously or in the worst case scenario with two 
thirds of the votes. And if that can't be achieved, well, then it's a simple majority. And if there's a split vote, it's the chair that take, is decisive. So that's how it works, according to the GDPR. But uh, we work very closely together, all data protection authorities, and uh, in the past we've also released guidelines that uh, have now been confirmed, and uh, they're in line with the GDPR, and I fully believe that all colleagues will reflect what is in the data protection regulation because we want to see the law applied properly in Europe. I mean, that's essentially what binds us, isn't it? Jan Albrecht for the Greens and Liebe, please. Thank you very much uh, to Mr. Satterfield also. Um, if you say that you follow the uh, law, of course, of the respective uh, state or country in which you act, uh, although I uh, could imagine that there could be more uh, ethical ideas behind also because there might be a difference between Europeans passing privacy laws and Chinese passing privacy laws, but okay, put that aside, you say you follow the law. Here there had been a lot of uh, judgments already in the European Union regarding the cross-use of WhatsApp and Facebook data. And um, I, I still wonder uh, from your questions, uh, on which legal basis are you doing that? And uh, if it's uh, in the term uh, or in the course of legitimate interest, I'm interested in how you uh, do the legitimate interest test in, in this regard of these purposes. How do you define legitimate interest in your uh, processing? And also you say, um, that uh, there is no data of persons not using the app processed, uh, but you process data via websites providing you on persons who are not using the app. Um, so the question is, is there a unique identifier to these data sets? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Albrecht. Uh, to your question about the legal bases we have, uh, for processing data, including processing data across our family of apps and services. We set those out in our data policy very clearly, the legal bases that we rely on. Yeah, well, the, we, we, we process data across our, our family of apps and services, be, you know, pursuant to legitimate interests and pursuant to the fulfilling the contract that we have with people. And so how do we think of legitimate interests? We think of legitimate interests as the way that the law requires us. We look, we consider the interests and we consider the fundamental rights of the person involved. Now, there are very legitimate interests that are, that are involved when we are processing data across our apps and services. You know, providing security is one of them. So one of the ways that we use Facebook, or rather Facebook and WhatsApp data across those services is we can identify a bad actor on WhatsApp or on Facebook and we can take the data and, and use it to prevent that bad actor from harming on the other service. So that's one of the ways that we do that. People should know that we're not using data across Facebook and WhatsApp to improve product experiences or for advertising. We've paused that in Europe. We're only using it for sort of internal purposes, security, providing analytics and tools, and preventing spam and other kinds of harm on our services. Um, to your question about processing, I think you had a question about processing non-user data and whether there are unique identifiers involved. When a, when a, uh, uh, when a third party incorporates a Facebook business tool, the like button, Facebook analytics or something like that, um, and, and a person uses that website or app, we do get standard header information as any company would that had that integration on the site. So that includes an IP address. That would include any cookies that had previously been set on the device. If it's a mobile device, it could be a unique identifier, the device identifier. All of this information is, is necessary in order to, to provide the basic service. So we've got to have an IP address to send back the like button. We've got to know where on the internet to send the like button to. We need the URL of the, of the site or the identification of the app. So yes, there are unique identifiers. But as I said before, the purposes for which we use non-user data are very limited. So things like security, providing aggregate analytics to sites, and providing our services. Okay. Um Next is Joseph Vine. Mr. Voss, you're, you're next after, well, you're next now, but don't injure yourself. 
I have to keep to the dehort list. Okay, calm, <laughs> stay calm, stay calm. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Voss for the EPP and Lee Bay for one minute, please. Yeah. So um, this now would be a question for Mr. Satterfield. Oh, I'm, I'm turning into German, sorry. Um, German, so just in case. Also, ich glaube, die, die Frage I think the question that I have is, I think it's come up twice already. So it's about fake news and the spread of fake news. But what naturally, it's already been answered to some extent. But I'd like to know what exactly has to be done in the future. And what should we also improve, perhaps, so that such things don't happen again. I think we need specific ideas about gaps in the law or possibilities, what we could do in order to get things uh, back in grip better. Thank you for that question. Uh, I, I described before some of the efforts that we're making around false news, but I, I understand your question to be broader than that. So what can we do as a society to tamp down on what is a, uh, you know, something that nobody wants to see on the Internet? Um, one of the things that we're doing uh, that we'd like to see more of is education efforts. How do you spot fake news? How can we more critically evaluate the sources of news that we're seeing? You know, one of the things that Facebook is doing is we're trying to show more news from broadly trusted sources and from local sources. But we, we can't do this alone. We, we have to help people become more critical consumers, more intentional consumers of news. Um, and that's something that you know, governments can help with, NGOs can help with. Uh, it's going to take a, a lot of efforts from across a lot of different organizations. But at the core, it's about educating people and making them more critical consumers of the information that's presented to them online. Okay, um, Joseph Weidenholzer for S&D and Libe, please. Thank you very much. A question for Mrs. Yenenek. A few weeks ago, Facebook um, undertook a big uh, awareness raising campaign c talking about its willingness to comply with the data protection measures. Now, can you see anything, any tangible impact of that or is it just a PR campaign? Also, when it comes to implementation in the member states, can you uh, identify any problems, any potential issues or uh, countries where you can identify good practice? Thirdly, what's your stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, protecting and strengthening consumer rights uh, through a, a collective class action type procedure? Thank you very much for that question. Just to respond on that last point of a class action, um, well, that's within the remit of member states. Um, in Austria, that was not something that was taken up by the parliament there, but it has been uh, used in other countries. Now, this means that you would be able to go further and be more effective. Secondly, on examples of good practice, the uh, data protection uh, regulation has been in force for four weeks now, and we've been able to see that the authorities have been cooperating very smoothly, and they've really drawn up a, a template that allows us to communicate effectively with regard to implementation in the 28 member states. There's one thing that's very clear here. The regulation is um, effective right away. It takes effect straight away. And that's the case whether or not accompanying legislation was drawn up at the national level. But obviously, in most cases, some sort of uh, uh, adjustment did take place within national uh, data protection law. And the first question, I do apologize. Could you remind me? Yes, the idea, the issue of PR. It's all well and good, but how, how much use is this? The reply. Well, in my opening remarks, I did say 
that it would be better to invest first in to uh, sound data protection and that would save you the trouble of having to apologize later down the line and that would have been far more cost effective first that's my first point and secondly obviously we take efforts seriously we do take note of um, efforts that are being made but as regards the impact i can't really comment and I wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to um, how things will pan out. And there are ongoing cases right now, and as you will know from reading media reports. Thank you. Barbara Spinelli for GUE and Libe, please. Given that the world community of users is a commercial invention, not corresponding to the personal right to have multiple rights, I have two questions for Mr. Deer. How can a single person know that their right is, is being breached and the profiles manipulated? Second, GDPR allows class action, even if a clear definition is lacking. It's a progress. Individual claims are expensive and too complicated. But the Court of Justice has limited the remedies available to consumers in European law, declaring that only the original contract partner of a business is a consumer. Do you think that the Court must correct itself in future case law and that Article 80 of GDPR is clear enough? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, how can individuals know about the, the information that's known about them? So the characteristic of the ad tech ecosystem is that it's extremely complex. It's completely mind-boggling. But it's also mind-boggling for companies that operate in that business. So there are actually some actors there whose role is precisely to organize information for the other commercial actors. I have the impression that if you go to some of them and you ask for your information with an access request, all the job of organizing that information about you is already partly done. So there are some specific actors whose business interest is in organizing the information. The thing is they don't work for you at the moment. Um, the problem is often that they shield themselves as processors rather than controllers. So that should be challenged very heavily. And in the written testimony, I offer some lines of thought on how to do that. And I hope, I very much hope, to get strong support from data protection authorities for doing this. Now, on the second question of Article 80 and the class actions and all of that, um, the problem is now, I think, for NGOs or nonprofits around Europe to find test cases. And I think that problem can be approached very differently. If we have good services that help people organize their information, and if the market is structured or there are enough incentives that such services can exist and be directly in the interest of users, truly in the interest of users, then the problems will pop up on their own. And it then becomes a problem of orienting those people to the right redress mechanisms. So for a lot of things around the GDPR, my opinion is actually that we should see what happens. We should be creative in how we use it as individuals. And I think there is a huge amount of opportunities that are completely untapped. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the EPP and Libe, Libya Euroka, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. If I would just, uh, if I could just uh, ask you to call out two, three of your uh, proposals that you are making uh, in your written. Uh, statement that would be one question that I would like to ask and the other one if you don't mind is uh, uh, on, on child rights I, I feel that it's a completely different situation being manipulated when you are no I'm not a completely different situation but I would like to ask on what more you can do on those people who are your users but are under 18 years old for example because we, we see I, I think my our main um, a concern is that we see our children being manipulated in very strongly. So are you aware or, or have you seen any of uh, these sort of manipulations ha happening maybe to, to children or already to older people apart from the voting manipulations that is on the table now? But when our children are going on, on, on uh, Facebook, you can follow up to whom their data was basically given. 
because once you open up the Facebook again of their account, the, the ads are coming in, pouring in. So you basically knew who, you got, who got the data of your child. And also in this sense, you can follow this up. Can you follow those up who are stealing your data for the same reason, manipulate us? Uh, without, uh, um, not, not politically manipulating us, I mean, but in any other sense that we are uh, censoring or feeling now. I think this is the main uh, problem that uh, your users have. Yeah, sorry. So the, the first you can't really ask. easy... Are you asking two questions? Yes. yes. Ask you can't ask... I mean, I, I just can't really break the rules. It sounds really bureaucratic, but... Okay, but you wanted a list from him, which I guess we... 20 seconds, I promise okay, you 20 good. seconds. So... Can we be flexible? We can be flexible. Okay. So the, the first cheap, easy thing to do is to promote the access right. There are so many journalists right now who would be very enthusiastic at using the access rights to report on the digital economy. If only they had support from data protection authorities, they would do that job and their salaries are already paid. It's not a question of, of means. That's the first suggestion. And the second one is to especially dig into data points that have to do with the interfacing of platforms with apps. That's the story with Cambridge Analytica, is that Facebook cannot untangle itself from Cambridge Analytica in this whole story if you dig carefully into all those data points. And so that's the combination of the two journalists looking into those data points would be extremely powerful. Quick one from Mr. Satterfield, if you could. Thanks. Thank you for those questions. I, I think they're extremely important. Uh, when you're talking about the, the, the use of, of minors' data, uh, for any purpose, including advertising. This is something we take extremely seriously. Uh, of course, the GDPR has a lot to say about the protection of young people's data. Um, I think most of the conversation has been around the age of consent rules, which, of course, we're, uh, we're, we're complying with. But uh, what's gotten less attention, I think, is the, is the GDPR's suggestion or requirement that information be provided to young people in a way that they can understand it. And, and that's where, where we focused a lot of effort, is in helping young people understand uh, the risks that they face online, understand how to protect their information, how to, how to, how to stay safe. Uh, but also, uh, you know, something I mentioned before is that it, it's not too early to start educating young people about how to be critical consumers of the information that they're seeing online. And so to your point about manipulation, we can start informing young people, we can start teaching young people um, you know, very early about how to, how to consume news online, how to think critically about things that are being presented to them. And that's something that where we've invested a lot of efforts, and we've invested a lot of efforts uh, for teens uh, specifically. That's an area where we're really proud. Okay, we, we have to stick to time now. It's, uh, we have to finish this at five to get to the next session. So next one is Birgit Sippel for the SND for ETRE this time. Thank you very much. Mr. Satterfield, just some minutes ago you confirmed that Facebook knowingly went into a relationship with an app whose terms and conditions reserved the right to send data to third parties. And you explained that everything is fine with Facebook, but that the third party was breaching the rules. Once again, you knowingly entered that relationship. And under EU law, you are the controller, so you are legally responsible. So once again, how can you really explain that your behavior at that time was in line with EU law? Well, I, I'm, I'm confident that it was, but clearly, uh, the way in which we handled Cambridge Analytica, I, I, I think we were in compliance with, with European data protection law. And, I, and it's a question that's going to be asked a lot, um, and there's going to be a lot of debate about it. I'm, I'm sitting here today to, saying that I, I believe we were in compliance with the law. Um, but sorry, I, that's not a question of believing. This is not a religious debate. Could you please give some concrete points? where you see that you are following the rules when I say you are the controller and you shouldn't have entered that relationship. Well, I, I think in retrospect, you know, the, the way in which we handled Cambridge Analytica, we could have done a lot better. We should have let people know 
uh, when, uh, when we discovered that uh, Dr. Kogan had wrongfully transferred the information to Cambridge Analytica. We breached the trust of the people uh, that we serve every day. And that's, that's why we're doing things differently now. Um, just to point out, supplementaries are not strictly allowed, but it's just so boring and uninformative if there aren't any. So, frankly, um, you know, it's just not quite human nature if nobody can ever uh, come back a little bit. So thank you to the speakers for accommodating that. Next is Marco Zullo from EFTD for IMCO. Thank you. This is a question to the representative of personal data. Now, today we're talking about Facebook, and that's the example we're using. Facebook, however, is a system that, whether you like it or not, is having an effect on the kind of society we live in. And I think, perhaps, to better protect users, we should at least discuss this business model. Facebook has said a great deal or is perhaps doing a great deal to ensure that users have the tools they need to control their data and how that data is used. But we're still basing ourselves on this idea of a proprietary closed system. The representative of personal data previously mentioned portability, the portability of data. Now, emphasizing portability means opening up the system and thinking of a new way of regulating an open system. Like, could that perhaps resolve the problem of improper use of data? I mean, would you think that's a worthwhile idea? Um, it's definitely a worthwhile idea. It's definitely a direction that has been opened up, for better or worse. Um, there could be all kinds of abuses of consent using portability, and those will be extremely hard to investigate and to challenge. Um, so far, customers who would put information into a website would have some grasp of the information they are providing and the possible consequences. But in the future, there could be data coming from all over that could really hurt them. It's going to become very hard. On top, portability could be used very selectively by the sources of data to promote some recipients over some others. So it creates new competition issues that are completely new. And this dynamic is open, regardless of what you know, this chamber does. So it's also opening new opportunities for regulation and for transparency and for involving more actors than just the data protection authorities into making sure the ecosystem works. Um, I think so I'll give you a concrete example. There are, there are more than 5,000 companies in marketing technology in the ad tech system. Many of them have profiles on all the members in this room. You can go to any of them and ask for your profiles, and this is completely disempowering on many people to just see a list of categories like this, not to know which is legal, which is not, and what are the consequences of each. But you could pull that data into, with portability into other systems that are on your side if only proper enforcement of the rules made for viable business models on that side. So I'm hopeful around portability, but it will be tricky to get the enforcement right. Okay, the final speaker in this session is uh, Barbara Kappel for ENF and ETRE, please. Thank you, Herr Vorsitzender. I have a question for Frau. Thank you very much. I have a question for Mrs. Janenek. You are responsible for the implementation of the uh, GDPR, and I think that's a big challenge. It's, You've said that you know you're responsible for decisions on certain cases of uh, interpretation and differences of opinions. So it's very, it's a very important opportunity to get this sort of general framework set up. And we've heard that Facebook is committed to implementing the GDPR. So my question to you is, if you do identify any violations of the implementation um, committed by uh, Facebook, then what would would you in recommend? We've got this issue of forced consent as well. That's a big issue. So what kind of steps would you then take? 
Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. It's not about taking, uh, recommending legal steps if there are infringements found based on the GDPR, then there are certain measures which we, it's not that we can in, in, uh, use these measures, but we have to. And the penalties have to be proportionate, they have to be efficient, and they have to be effective. So it's not a question of recommendations, rather it's a question of implementation of the law, as you've quite rightly pointed out. It's about a general application of this uh, regulation across Europe. That's one thing. And for the second, the global standards, well, Europe is setting the pace. There are a number of countries which are interested in the regulation, not only because they have to comply with it when they are active in Europe and, and doing business in Europe, but also because they see it as a role model, not just something which uh, one can have in Europe, and not necessarily only in the West, but also uh, in the East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of session one. I thank the speakers and speakers' witnesses uh, for that session. Thank you to the members for their patience. We now begin straight away with session two, the impact and risks for electoral processes. And I should be joined here by the chair of AFCO, Tanita Hudner. Uh, there she is, excellent. So um, as our colleagues, Claire Bassett, chief executive of the UK Electoral Commission and Joel Kaplan, vice president, um, of Global Public Policy for Facebook. Take their seats. We can begin. Very brief because... Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, colleagues, uh, please stay with us for this important session. We have two speakers, um, and I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Mrs. Hubner uh, to make a, a short, uh, a very short uh, introductory statement for AFCO, who, of course, also as a committee are interested in this uh, particular issue about the risks for electoral processes. Uh, Dinita, if you want to, to make a brief statement, please. Just, just indeed a few words on, on the issues which uh, I, I think are, are also an important uh, framework for this uh, discussion. One of them is the withdrawal of the UK from the Union, and the other one is the nine selections to the European Parliament we are going to have in a year, more or less in a year from, uh, from now. We are waiting, actually, uh, for the results of the UK investigation uh, by the UK Information Commission, and we hope that conclusions will be uh, drawn with regard to the referendum of, uh, in UK, because we, we know that when bad things happen, uh, then I think we have to know exactly what uh, happened, what cost them, and, and how it happened. So this is just for the future uh, prevention. And also let me say that uh, with regard to the elections to European Parliament uh, uh, next year, next year we are going to vote next week on uh, some new rules um, uh, to conduct uh, these uh, elections uh, for the first time since uh, 40 years. And I would like to tell you also that we are going to push in those rules to push for uh, further for advancement in, in having electronic and online voting uh, possibilities open much more broadly than it has been uh, so far. And we want to be sure that personal data will be protected. Uh, we, we have to ensure also the citizens who will be voting and candidates also who will be voted uh, that we all have this, um, uh, th this feeling that everything is, is okay. And let me also say that we will have a novelty because those rules which will be amended in the European electoral uh, law, they will move also, the, uh, they will change the format of the legal act and these rules will be uh, now um, have the weight of the Union Act, which means that for the first time they will be also subject to the judicial scrutiny by, Euro scrutiny by European Court of Justice, and this will give uh, citizens much greater legal certainty than uh, before. 
Uh, last thing on, on technologies, how we see them, that they are, of course, a blessing, but they can be also a curse when it comes to uh, elections, and because they provide, on the one hand, this unprecedented opportunity to reach out to the electorate, but at the same time, they might open, as we, as we know today uh, very well, uh, the door to unlawful uses of personal data to manipulate the voters' uh, choices. And here the legislators have to intervene, and I hope that the general data protection uh, regulation will bring the appropriate legal framework also for citizens uh, to, to have their rights uh, protected and their personal data uh, protected. Uh, but we also know that uh, for this really to happen, we also need to raise awareness uh, among citizens. Uh, they have to be willing to exercise their data protection rights effectively, and they have to know what it means really when they do this uh, clicking of uh, agree with the terms. Uh, that's also extremely important. Um, and uh, let me just conclude uh, by, uh, by saying that, uh, of course, uh, we need to find the appropriate way to regulate and set clear rules on the use of data analytics in um, electoral uh, campaigns. And that is very important that all the actors who participate in those processes, they have to be made accountable. And this certainly co requires gro global collective uh, effort. The problem is much bigger, I believe, than Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. And we need to solve it globally because tomorrow it, it will again reappear under a different uh, name. We have to be prepared for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanuta. So our first uh, speaker witness um, will speak to one of the countries in which there was alleged impact and risk, um, and that is Claire Bassett, Chief Executive of the UK Electoral Commission, for up to 10 minutes, and you're warmly welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to start uh, just by briefly outlining what the role of the UK Electoral Commission actually is in regulating elections and referendum campaigns in the UK, because I think that's a really important context of the role that we've played uh, in addressing some of the challenges that we're looking at today. The Electoral Commission is a parliamentary body that was created in the year 2000. We're independent of governments, and our remit covers the UK, uh, or that's all UK-wide elections and referendums, as well as those in Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Uh, we have responsibilities for supporting the administration of well-run polls and the delivery of referendums. But today I'm going to focus on our function as the, as the regulator of campaign finance. And at the very heart of this role is that we're a financial regulator. When Parliament created the Electoral Commission, it decided that the most effective way of regulating political campaigns was to introduce controls and requirements around how these are financed. We therefore regulate campaigns by enforcing rules surrounding the funding and where money comes from and how it is spent. Uh, we also maintain the register of political parties and campaigners and enforce the rules around who, mu who must apply to join that register. Just to illustrate how this form of regulation works, because again I think it's a very useful context for the committee today, I'm going to run through a few of these things. Firstly, any political party that wishes to appear on a ballot paper must join the register and provide basic information about the party to do so. We also have strict non-party campaign rules, and these require campaigners to register when they spend over a certain threshold at an electoral event. At the EU referendum, any campaigner spending over £10,000 was required to register as a permitted participant, and indeed two campaigners were designated by us at the Electoral Commission as lead campaigners, one for each side. There are no limits on the amount of donations and loans that a campaigner may receive, but these must come from a permissible source. A permissible donor is an individual who's on the UK electoral register or a company registered in the UK, and it's against the rules to attempt to evade this and by hiding the true source of the donation. All donations must be reported by political parties, and for other campaigners during referendum, they're required to be reported during the campaign period. Pre- and post-poll donation reports are required in those cases. Spending during the campaign period must be reported, and that is limited. And spending's limit, limits are set by Parliament, and they vary from £7 million for the lead campaigner at the EU referendum uh, through to 700000 for other campaigners. And at parliamentary general elections, it's based on a formula, uh, roughly allowing about £19 million for major parties and £30,000 for individual candidates. Uh, 
Um, the length of the reporting period, however, does vary quite considerably during events, and this has a really significant impact on our ability to regulate those campaigns. For a UK parliamentary general election, that's a year long, but for the EU referendum, that was only 10 weeks. Spending returns are submitted after the poll. Major parties and campaigners have up to six months to do this, and those spending less than three months. The Electoral Commission then, spends, then publishes these spending returns within a few weeks. And what this does is it allows that anyone who's interested to look and scrutinise that information at the same time as we carry out our own assessments. The Electoral Commission does not have a remit covering the content of campaigns, including any claims that are made during those campaigns. We do, however, monitor campaign activity, but that's to make sure that its reporting has been correctly done by campaigners. We may identify campaign activity undertaken by unregistered campaigners, and in those instances, we'll contact that person or organisation uh, and seek to get them registered as a campaigner. If that is refused, we can issue a stop notice for the activity, although we've yet had reason to do so. Um, campaigners must report spending on all activity undertaken during that campa campaign period, and that includes things that were paid for before that period started, but utilised during it. The spending returns break down how those funds were spent and require invoices to support them. These rules I've outlined to you in most cases come from a pre-digital era. That, however, they do continue to be relevant and largely effective. Digital campaigning has been an evolution of existing campaign techniques. It allows campaigners to do the same things but at a much greater scale, more cheaply and more quickly. For example, we have always had micro-targeting. It's just moved from sending a leaflet to people who live in a particular street who might be affected by the closure of a local public service to a much more sophisticated way of getting messages through to people with a shared interest. At this point, I think it's important for me to say that we believe firmly that campaigning to elections and referendums is a really good thing, and it's a very important part of any such event. Digital campaigning has had a significant and powerful and positive impact on engagement in elections. It's allowed more people than ever to be involved in it and to be part of that public debate. And indeed, we've seen record levels of, t of uh, electorates at recent events. However, we also believe that voter confidence is vital and it's a very important part of successful elections. And it, therefore, it's very important that we have transparency and accountability around this campaigning so voters know who is saying what to them. And as I've said before, we do already have robust rules. However, these could be improved and need to be improved to ensure that we continue to meet the challenges that we're facing. For example, the existing rules do capture how money, spent on the databases prior to, how money is spent on a database prior to an election, and it does require reporting of that. But there's a number of improvements around that would allow us to more thoroughly examine that and test it. Uh, for example, we've been calling since 2003 for the extension of imprints uh, to digital as well as print advertising. And indeed, we saw that at the Scottish independence referendum. And this is something we would like, we're very welcome that government recent consultation. Secondly, we'd like to see improvements on the reporting category so these reflect digital campaigning properly. The current categories are now out of date, so we and others cannot see in sufficient detail how money has been spent on digital activity. We'd also like invoices to be required in significant detail. One of the challenges we have at the moment is often this is just reported as digital consultancy, and we're unable to see the detail of what that actually means. Further, we would like to see staff costs included for all types of campaigning. This currently varies depending on the type of election and the, the campaigner. Um, but as an increasing proportion of campaign costs is the people that are working on them, we want this extended to all. Social media companies should also consistently implement some of the changes they propose, such as showing where the ads come from and providing a register of this. This information would be a really important part of allowing us to check that spending returns were accurate. And more importantly, it would offer voters transparency. Although again, this needs to report the actual person saying it rather than just agencies. I am aware that much of the focus of this committee's work has been on the use of data, and you recently heard from Elizabeth Denham, the UK Information Commissioner. The Electoral Commission is highly supportive of the work of the ICO, and it's been very important that we work together, both sharing information but also respecting each other's remits. It is not for the UK Electoral Commission to look into how data has been used, as that's Elizabeth's area of expertise and her team are working on that. Our role, as I've just outlined, is to look at how the money is spent and whether this is in, within the existing rules. And it's very important that we run that together because actually if we have the right information and then the regulation works properly. There are rules that limit where money can come from, 
but not where it can be spent, only that it must be spent properly. Therefore, it is legitimate for a UK campaigner to spend money on experts or service providers based abroad as long as this is correctly reported. In practice, that means that use of firms such as Cambridge Analytica or Agra IQ is entirely legal within UK electoral law. The remit of the Electoral Commission is also UK specific, which means we do not have powers over those based outside the UK. We're interested in proposals to limit the ability of foreign actors to place adverts on social media in our country during elections, but also there's other activity that we shouldn't forget that seeks to um, disrupt elections, which is often part of much wider efforts to disrupt public life, and that's something we work closely with the security services on. Finally, I'd just like to draw attention to our wider duty around supporting public confidence in our electoral system. And as part of this work, we've recently been carrying out inquiries into digital campaigning. We're taking learning from our recent post-election reports, from the investigations which we've concluded and which are ongoing, and we've been in dialogue to, uh, with others. And indeed, tomorrow morning, we'll be publishing uh, our report into this, setting out some of the changes that we'd like to see. This will be the first of our findings into this inquiry, and it will include a number of changes, including the ones that I've outlined above. It will call, call for some enhanced powers for the Electoral Commission, and particularly our ability to enforce those rules and to apply much stronger sanctions against those who break them. I apologise this is a necessarily quick run-through and it hasn't focused on the data, but hopefully it sets out the context in which we have approached this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our second speaker um, witness is Joe Kaplan, Vice President of Facebook. Uh, welcome and please uh, go ahead and make your statement. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the chairs and the European Parliament for having me here today to talk about the events that have come to light in recent months and to share the measures that we're taking at Facebook to protect elections around the world. It's also an honor to share this panel with Ms. Bassett. Uh, I know our teams have worked closely together on a number of initiatives in the UK and I hope we have the opportunity to continue to do so. I want to start by reiterating what our CEO Mark Zuckerberg said when he was here in Brussels last month. Protecting the integrity of elections here in Europe is a top priority for us at Facebook. Our commitment to election security and integrity includes individual country elections across Europe as well as the European parliamentary elections next May. At Facebook, we firmly believe that our platform can be a force for good in the democratic process. We also believe that civil discourse can thrive when it is authentic and accurate. Here in Europe, we see citizens using our platform to share their views on matters of public interest <clears throat> it, with their representatives and governments, and we see policymakers, like many of you, using our tools to engage directly with constituents in ways that would not have been possible or even imaginable a decade ago. But it has also become clear over the past 18 months that our platform can be abused by those with intent to undermine the integrity of the electoral process. During the 2016 U.S. election, Foreign actors took advantage of open online platforms like Facebook to divide people and to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt. At Facebook, we were too slow to respond to this threat, focused instead on traditional attacks like phishing and malware. While we cannot turn back the clock, we can make sure the same kind of attack does not happen again, and we are taking this responsibility very seriously. I do want to reiterate at the outset something my colleague said in the last panel, that as far as Cambridge Analytica is concerned, our best information today is that Dr. Kogan did not share the Facebook information of any non-US persons, including Europeans, with Cambridge Analytica. As my colleague also said, we will not be able to confirm this until we can complete a forensic audit of Cambridge Analytica, which we plan to do as soon as we are authorized to do so by the UK ICO. Since the 2016 U.S. election, we've learned important lessons and have evolved our approach around elections. We've made many significant investments in both people and technology to make these kind of attacks much harder. And we've successfully deployed these new tools and approaches in recent European elections in France, Germany, and Italy. Our efforts are focused on five main areas, combating foreign interference, cracking down on fake accounts, reducing the spread of false news, increasing ads transparency, and supporting an informed electorate. In each of these areas, I want to explain our thinking and our progress to date. 
The first area we're focused on is combating foreign interference. The reality is that each election will have a different range of actors and face a different range of threats. One of the things our security team is focused on is looking ahead of each upcoming election and working with both external experts and governments to understand the actors involved and the specific risks in each country. We also know that in order to fight foreign interference, we need to invest much more heavily in security. So as you've heard, we're doubling the number of people who work on security and safety issues this year from 10,000 to 20,000. Advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence allow, allow us to proactively look for potentially harmful types of election-related activity, such as pages of foreign origin that are distributing inauthentic civic content. This proactive approach has allowed us to move more quickly and has become an important way for us to prevent misleading or divisive memes from going viral. We first piloted this capability last year around the time of a special election in the U.S. state of Alabama. By looking specifically for foreign interference, we were able to identify a previously unknown set of Macedonian political spammers that appeared to be financially motivated. We then quickly blocked them from our platform. We've since deployed these tools in other elections, including the recent election this spring in Italy. The second area we're focused on is cracking down on fake accounts. We believe that most bad actors on Facebook are hiding behind false identities. Over the past year, we've continuously improved at finding and disabling fake accounts, and we now block millions of fake accounts each day at the point of creation before they can do any harm. We've been able to do this thanks to advances in machine learning, which have allowed us to find suspicious behaviors without assessing the content itself. The third area we're focused on is reducing the spread of false news. We know that people want to see accurate information on Facebook, and so do we. We've introduced several products to help curb the spread of false news and show fewer stories that are misleading, sensational, or spammy. Because most fake news is economically motivated, we're going after those economic incentives, banning sites that regularly run false news from using our ads products so they can't make money out of it. We've also improved our systems to penalize clickbait and sensationalism, downranking inauthentic or ad farm driven content. However, we know we can't do this alone, so we're also scaling partnerships with third party fact checkers and educating our users on false news directly. Since we first launched the third party fact checking program last spring, we've expanded it to 14 countries and have plans to scale to more countries by the end of the year. These certified independent fact checkers rate the accuracy of stories on Facebook, allowing us then to reduce the distribution of stories rated as false by an average of 80%. Additionally, we're focused on educating our users through public service announcements, discussing tips for spotting and reporting false news. We've launched these in a variety of countries around the world, both on and off Facebook. The fourth area I want to touch on is our commitment to advertising transparency. We believe people should be able to easily understand why they're seeing ads, who paid for them, and what other ads that advertiser is running targeted at other people. This is especially true for political ads. We've taken a variety of steps in this area in the past few months, including building a new tool called View Ads. View Ads allows you to see all of the different messages an advertiser or political actor is running, whether or not you receive the ad or follow the page. This will help fight dark ads online and introduce much greater transparency. The View Ads tool will launch in Europe and around the world very soon. The fifth and final area I want to touch on is our work supporting civic engagement. Civic discourse is something we at Facebook strongly believe in, and we have a long track record of working with electoral commissions and bodies around the world to help achieve their goals of building an informed electorate. To date, we've launched our voter megaphone in over 50 countries, driving users to the polls on election day. And in many countries, we've partnered with the Electoral Commission on voting registration, and as a result, have helped register thousands or hundred thousands or even millions of voters. In coordination with nonpartisan groups, we're also committed to building products to help people understand their ballots and to learn more about candidates and parties. Ahead of the UK and French elections, we launched a tool called Political Perspectives. When you click or tap on it, you're able to compare the major political parties' perspectives on a number of issues. Lastly, we've created a training process for policymakers, politicians, candidates, and their staff to help them understand how their accounts could be abused and to share advanced tips 
for safety and security during election periods. Even as we prioritize elections integrity work across Facebook, we know that protecting the democratic process is an effort larger than one company or one industry, and we seek to partner with government, academics, and civil society on this important work. We're working more closely with governments to share information about threats and better understand the unique threats in each particular country. Ahead of the German elections last year, for example, we worked closely with the Federal Office for Information Security, or BSI, to share information and threat intelligence. Ahead of the Italian elections in March, we worked closely with Italian regulator Agicom to define guidelines on how politicians should be using online tools and to fight the spread of misinformation online. Last week's report, published by OSCE and Agicom, concluded that the majority of OSCE observers did not consider disinformation to be a particular problem in the campaign. We're also working more closely with external partners. A few weeks ago, we announced a partnership with the Atlantic Council in which experts from their digital forensic research lab will work closely with our security, policy, and product teams to get Facebook real-time insights and updates on emerging threats and disinformation campaigns around the world. This is a strong partnership, all in an effort to increase the number of eyes and ears we have to spot abuse on our service. Finally, in April, we announced a new initiative, a commission to help provide independent, credible research about the role of social media in elections, as well as democracy more generally. This initiative will enable Facebook to learn from the advice and analysis of outside academic experts so we can make better decisions, decisions and faster progress. Protecting the integrity of elections will never be a solved problem. The threats that we see will change, and we as a company, an industry, and as a society will have to evolve with them. We face sophisticated, well-funded adversaries who are constantly seeking new ways to get around our defenses. While we cannot guarantee that all abuse will be eradicated, we are committed to making the investments we need to stay ahead. We can best defend the integrity of elections when we work in collaboration with political parties, election regulators, governments, and academic experts. We very much look forward to continuing to build these collaborations, including with the European Parliament, over the coming months to do all we can to protect the upcoming elections together. Thank you very much um, to both. And now we um, go straight to the questions. It's one minute question and two minutes answering. And we go first to Danuta Hubner for the EPP in AFCO, please. Thank you very much. I, I would like to ask Claire Bassett, actually, to reaching out to your experience as the Chief Executive of the UK Electoral Commission. Th this case that has brought us here has also gained a lot of publicity Europe-wide. And my question to you is, can it just, does it have potential to undermine also the trust of citizens in digitalization? Or would you also think that there might be a negative impact on citizens' participation in future elections? Uh, or you think it's not really the case? I know that you don't know, but just try. I, I, I was going to say, I think it's a really good question. Um, I, think, I think the first thing to remember about all of this is that um, we can speculate about what people did, what they didn't do, what fake news was there. But um, the causal link between that and people's actual decision about which way to vote is much less clear. And um, we do have some research which shows some bits of this, but actually um, we and independent researchers don't have data because that's held by the social media companies in order to know that. So I think we need to be careful not to uh, put too much power in the hands of those people who did things they shouldn't have done by just assuming that they were able to do that. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing at the Commission recently as part of our inquiry is some uh, public opinion research into uh, attitudes towards digital campaigning in particular. Um, there, there is definitely a really enhanced awareness of this and there is a desire to see people such as the Electoral Commission playing a more active role, which we're responding to. But I think people, and it's the point about education, people are also, this is raising awareness and this is a much broader issue about social media. It's not just pertinent to elections and people are beginning to sort of triangulate what they look at and what they see. And I think that's a good thing. I think as we educate people and people start to be slightly more questioning of what's put in front of them, that, then that's, that's a positive thing going forward. And, and I would go back to, to what I said when I was speaking that um, we have actually seen record electorates and turnouts over the last major events in, in the UK and, and particularly with young people and I think, I think that's really positive. Thank you. Next question is mine for S&D and Libby. 
Um, I just want to go ask Joe Kaplan and go deep, more deeply into how Facebook are dealing with uh, the, the deep concern we have on how um, we're having interference in our elections. Um, there was a recent report that you've hired ex-intelligence officers, researchers, media buyers to sort of test the destruction uh, what you're doing um, in worst case scenarios. Could I ask you now what, um, how this would affect the alleged interference in specific cases, the UK uh, referendum, for example, the Brexit referendum, or alleged Russian interference um, in other elections? I mean, give us, give us a, a kind of snapshot of now how you would be able to deal with that situation, whereas before you wouldn't. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's, a, it's an excellent question, and it really goes to the heart of what we're focused on. Um, that article focused on uh, the additional people and resources that we're now bringing uh, onto our team to help us develop the expertise and the understanding uh, that we can deploy uh, as elections happen all around the world. Um, and and uh, we have to have more of that capability in-house, uh, but as I said in my opening remarks, we also need to cooperate very closely with experts on the ground uh, in countries where elections are happening. And so uh, we've committed resources to, to deal directly with electoral commissions in these countries uh, so that we understand what the unique threats are in each country. Now, we didn't have those capabilities fully developed before the 2016 U.S. elections, and we've learned quite a bit since then about the full range of tools and toolkit that we need to put together before each election. So as, uh, as we come up on each major election, uh, we're putting together a cross-functional team from across the company uh, to focus on all of the different tools that I mentioned, the tools to combat foreign interference, to identify fake accounts, to educate people uh, about false news, to provide uh, ads transparency, and to inform voters. All of those things are going to have to be deployed uh, for each and every election. And uh, we feel, based on the experience we've had over the last uh, many months, whether it be the French election, uh, where we were able to take down 30-something 30 some, 30 thousand additional fake accounts uh, in the weeks before the election, or the German election, where we cooperated quite closely with the Federal Office of Information Security, uh, or the Italian election, where we were able to uh, work with an independent third-party fact-checker uh, to, to uh, identify fake news and reduce its distribution. All of these tools are going to have to be brought to bear in each election, and that's what we're committed to do. Thomas Chodowski for the EPP and Libe, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair, for the floor, and thank you for being here today, Mr. Kaplan. We have been expecting Mr. Goldman, but we will make do with uh, 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 your kind presence at today's meeting. Uh, you said that Facebook was uh, or is a democratic platform for exchange of information, but how can I trust a company which takes so much time before it closes false accounts which uh, keep reappearing as myself, which keep using my own photographs? What did you do in, in order to stop this, uh, stop such situations to, from repeating? And Cambridge Analytica, it, sh it has been showed that there were influences by Cambridge Analytica in elections in various European countries, including the Czech uh, Republic, because your colleague uh, said that this was only the, the United States. And lastly, when we visited Facebook, every but he spoke about you being a uh, uh, socially responsible corporation. Are you indeed doing everything uh, for us to believe you this? Okay, colleagues, please stick to time. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the questions. I'll, I'll try to hit all three of them. Um, with respect to fake accounts, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a challenging problem, but it's one that we've dedicated to tremendous amounts of uh, technological resources towards and where we've improved dramatically. Um, as my colleague on the last panel uh, pointed out, we're now removing literally millions of fake accounts or blocking millions of fake accounts from registering before anybody actually even sees them. Uh, and in the last quarter, we recently reported that we removed uh, over 500 million fake accounts. 
So we're taking tra uh, dramatic action against fake accounts. As I said in my opening, this will never be a solved problem, and we're dealing with very sophisticated adversaries, and we're just going to have to keep keep investing and keep uh, developing new tools and new technology and deploying them against the threat, and that's what we're committed to do. It's why we've doubled the number of people working on safety or security this year. Uh, with respect to Cambridge Analytica's influence in other elections in Europe, I can only repeat uh, what I said and what, and what Mr. Satterfield said in the previous section. The best information that we have to date is that Dr. Kogan uh, did not share European user data uh, with Cambridge Analytica. And so uh, assertions or allegations about Cambridge Analytica uh, influencing other elections, we've not seen evidence to date that that involved uh, any inappropriately obtained Facebook information. Uh, again, I do want to caution, we have to get a forensic audit to be able to confirm that because only Cambridge Analytica really knows how it put together uh, its, its targeting capabilities. Last. Uh, the last thing you asked is uh, whether we're a socially responsible company. Uh, we certainly intend to be. Um, as Again, as Mr. Satterfield said, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether I or anybody else says that we're socially responsible. Uh, what's going to matter is whether you and the people who use Facebook conclude from our actions uh, that we're doing everything we can uh, to take a broader view of our responsibilities and, and, and to address the abuses we find on our platform. That's our commitment, um, but, but all of you will judge whether we've lived up to it. Mercedes Bresso for S&D and AFCO. Sono qua. <laughs> grazie, grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, I also want to go back on that issue of 500,000 fake accounts in three months. I mean, that is massive. Don't you think that the best thing to do would be to ensure that people have some kind of digital identity? I mean, for example, in Estonia now, if you want to comment on online newspapers, you have to use your ID card, it's a digital ID card, and that certifies who you are. Obviously that can't only be something that's done in one country, but perhaps working on establishing some kind of digital identity would help, wouldn't it? I mean, you said uh, 500 million, but uh, the other problem, of course, is how many of them were there that got through? So are we talking millions or well, hopefully fewer, but how many do you think will have escaped or would have got through the net? And then I've got another question, but I'll ask later. Thank you. Um, it, it was 500 million uh, that we were able to take down in the first quarter. Uh, one of the things we've done recently in order to demonstrate our commitment is that we're, we're releasing more data uh, of the, uh, about how many uh, of the different types of abuses we're able to identify on Facebook, how many we've taken action against. Um, our estimate, and we've, we've published this uh, previously uh, in connection with our, with our annual reports, is that there's about 3 to 4 percent of accounts at any one time that are fake. Um, that, is, that is a large number that we just have to keep hammering away at uh, and using all of the tools at our disposal, investing in artificial intelligence, uh, investing in machine learning, so that we can, we can see from the behaviors of the people that are registering accounts um, that they are fake and they don't represent an authentic person. On the question of a, of a digital identity for everybody, uh, I can only say that people in different countries and policymakers in different places around the world, I think, might have different views on the, on the wisdom of, or desirability of that. Um, there are always, again, issues uh, like the ones we're talking about here today, about data and data protection, and obtaining more data about individuals, I think, might also raise some of those concerns for people. Um, but we're certainly open to, to talking to, to governments about the right way to do this. When we, uh, when we have a suspicion that an account is fake, oftentimes we will put that account into what we call a checkpoint, so we basically block them from further access to Facebook until they provide us with an ID that demonstrates they're who they say they are. But we do reserve that for instances when we have reasons to be suspicious rather than uh, asking everybody uh, for a digital ID or, or some sort of uh, official form of ID upon registration. Uh, George Shufflin, please. EPP and AFCO. Thank you, Chair. Now, I have to say I'm distinctly perturbed by what I have heard. What I take from the foregoing 
is the structural and irremediable insecurity of digitalization. I quote Mr. Kaplan, it will never be a solved problem. So is there any future for e-government and e-voting? And Mr. Kaplan, is there anything you want to say about the Hungarian elections? When I say it's, it will never be a solved problem, I think, that that's, I think that that's an accurate assessment of the battle that any digital company and, frankly, any law enforcement organization has against bad actors uh, and criminal activity, particularly in the cyber realm. Um, it's just a recognition that we, we are facing adversaries who are well-funded, they're sophisticated, um, and they're going to continue to evolve their techniques and their capabilities uh, and, and so we, as, as Facebook, as well as law enforcement and intelligence officials around the world, have to continually be evolving our capabilities and our tools um, so that we can stay one step ahead of them. That's our commitment. We're, uh, we're investing tremendous resources, both in terms of personnel that we're hiring uh, and the technology that we're investing in, um, in ways that are likely to have an, a negative impact on our profitability. Um, but we think that's worth doing and important to do in order to provide the most protection that we can. When it comes to e-government and, and e-voting, um, that's we don't, we don't offer that particular service on Facebook. Governments will have to decide for themselves whether they're able to provide adequate security uh, to, allow, to allow that kind of activity to take place. Um, in terms of getting more people involved in the process and more people voting, one would hope that that's something governments could pursue, um, but of course it does uh, ultimately depend upon their confidence level in the services provided. Pedro Silva Pereira for S&D and AFCO, please. Thank you, Chair. For Mr. Kaplan as well. Um, after the Cambridge Analytical scandal, it is uh, obvious that you recognize there was a serious breach of trust and you have to be more pro proactive, and I do uh, acknowledge uh, your efforts. But uh, um, my question is, are you fully aware of the massive use of your platform all over the world to spread overwhelming waves of false information and to promote all sorts of black campaigns uh, for political purposes. Because if that is so, my question is, is this really all you can do? Or are you ready to recognize that uh, what you're doing is simply not uh, enough in face of the problem we have? Thanks for the question. Uh, we, we certainly are aware and have become increasingly aware over the last 18 months uh, of exactly the types of threats uh, to elections that, that you raise, particularly from false news and the spread of misinformation uh, online. As I've said, we're taking a number of very important steps, um, starting with removing the fake accounts that we've talked about, which are so often uh, responsible for much of the false news we see on Facebook. We've made tremendous progress there. Uh, eliminating the financial incentives as much as we can. A lot of the content that we see, the misinformation that we see spread on Facebook, people assume that it has a political motivation because it uh, pertains to political subjects, but very often what we find is that those are financial actors, essentially spammers, who used to focus on sending emails um, but now have tried to move on to a new platform what we need to do is to remove their ability to monetize that presence on Facebook and drive them off of our platform and get them to go do something else. We've had tremendous success there as well. Um, we've changed our algorithms to reduce uh, sensationalism and clickbait and to favor uh, content and news that comes from local, informative, and broadly trusted sources. And uh, as, we've, as I've discussed, we've launched partnerships with a number of independent fact checkers around the world um, who, who can rate content on Facebook uh, as false when it's identified to them, and then we can take the action of reducing its distribution and its spread. So we, we've made tremendous strides over the last year, year and a half or so since the 2016 U.S. elections. We know we have much more work to do. We know we need to collaborate with governments, with experts, with academics. Um, but we do see that we've made progress, and in, in a number of major elections, uh, France, Germany, Italy, uh, we've seen that the steps we've taken have been effective uh, in improving the protection of those elections. And we're just going to continue to work on it and try to get better with each passing election. Kaya Callas from Audi and Itri, please. 
Uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> you talk about the, uh, how you identify the manipulation of, of the elections or, or everything around that, and you bring examples from Germany, Italy, and France. Uh, but uh, in Europe, there are also small languages, small countries. Uh, I come from such a small uh, country, and, and we only have like one million people that speak our language. So my question is, do you make efforts to identify the manipulations there as well, or is it too small for you? Because, you know, we also have elections. We have a neighbor that is definitely interested in the result of our elections. So, uh, and, and our people are using Facebook and our people are trusting Facebook. So, so what is your answer to the small countries and languages? Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a really important question. Um, and we know that the, the European Union parliamentary elections uh, are in particular a big challenge because we'll have 27 uh, countries voting all at once. Um, a number of the tools that I've described uh, don't focus on the language at all, actually. Uh, so the, the fake accounts, the tools that we use, the machine learning, the artificial intelligence that we use to identify fake accounts, uh, those are based on the behavior of the actor who establishes the account, the, the account um, and they don't depend in any way on our analysis or assessment of the content of the account. So we don't have to look at language for those tools to be effective. Uh, similarly, with the financial motivations, we don't have to look at the at the content. We just we can look at whether those uh, pages and those ad, those uh, that news content is being used to drive traffic to ad farms or sensational content. Uh, so we can we can uh, we can and will deploy those tools as well. And then there are other tools like our PSAs, uh, excuse me, that's uh, public service announcements um, that we can deploy in any number of countries, uh, and we can work with the electoral commissions in even small countries uh, to be able to to get those out in advance of elections and help people um, make sense and and uh, think critically about the content that they see on Facebook. Anna Gomez for S and D and Libby. Yes, Ms. Bassett, have you found evidence of interference in elections in UK, including the referendum, through Cambridge Analytica, SCL, uh, associated companies like uh, Behavioral Dynamics, uh, to pr associated to private companies such as uh, the Big Four Accountancies uh, or Henley and Partners Group? who work with governments to establish schemes on the sale of citizenship and residence like the Tier 1 residence visas in the UK? And what are the measures that you are taking to ensure that journalists uh, hit by the slap uh, actions, uh, court lawsuits by uh, companies uh, of this kind to intimidate uh, journalists uh, will not be successful? Can I ask also something to Mr. Kaplan? Do you think, was it by your no, collaboration no, you, with you, SCL you. and Cambridge, I mean, Cambridge Analytica, SCL, uh, is it by naivety, incompetence, greed, complicity? Naivety, greed, that's fine. You've got Thanks. three in. Um, you, you got the abuse and she can get, take the question. <laughs> Sounds like a good deal to me. Um, I think, uh, just to go back to what I said at the beginning, um, you, the fact that Cambridge Analytica and other companies may have been a service provider during the election was entirely allowed under electoral law. Um, and so uh, we haven't investigated beyond whether campaigners reported accurately what they spent with those organisations. Um, there are other investigations that we have also ongoing around the permissibility where services were donated, um, but unfortunately I can't comment on ongoing investigations today. The only one that we have concluded showed that um, there was uh, discussions, but they were correctly reported. So I'm afraid I can't add a lot on there. Similarly, um, around you know, the actions taken towards journalists, um, that's outside of the remit of the UK Electoral Commission. So we, you know, it, it is not our role to, um, to, to investigate or look at behaviour of large organisations, wherever they come from, approach to journalists, particularly outside of the time of election. We just don't have powers or a remit to do that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Max Anderson for the Greens at AFCO, please. Thank you. 
the Brexit referendum is affecting a huge change on a margin of less than 4%. We need to know if it was conducted lawfully. Facebook has the information that would enable us to judge this, but so far it has refused to hand over material relating to this to the UK Parliament. There is evidence that data stolen from Facebook was used to create profiles of marginal voters who were then bombarded by propaganda adverts funded by Vote Leave and Be Leave. So, to Facebook, are you prepared to share the information you hold on all political advertising that was shown to UK voters during both the 10-week regulated period before the referendum and in the six months before the vote? And do you commit to providing the same transparency to both users and investigators for future campaigns? This includes data on how much money was spent, by whom, who these adverts were targeting, based on what data, etc. Thank you for answering. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Um, we have answered a tremendous number of questions from the British Parliamentary Committee. We sent our chief technology officer there to testify for five hours. We've answered uh, several rounds of follow-up questions. We've tried to be uh, quite responsive to the, to the Parliamentary Committee in its efforts to investigate um, what transpired around, around Brexit. Um, we agree that uh, there's real value in transparency around ads, and our intent is to build tools prospectively that allow people to see uh, who an ad is, uh, who's being targeted by an ad and how much was spent on it. Uh, that's being launched, uh, that's been launched in the United States. We do expect to launch that in the UK uh, this year. Um, and we'll continue to develop tools to help people uh, understand why they're seeing an ad that they're seeing, uh, who paid for the ad, and uh, who, who was reached by the ad. When it comes to providing all of the retrospective information about every single ad that was run by anybody who participated in, in prior campaigns, uh, that's not something uh, that we can do consistent with prior commitments to people's privacy. Um, and it, it's, it's just not something we can do until we've given people notice that that's what we're going to do going forward. We, we have provided uh, information about um, any IRA-related advertising in Brexit. We found uh, only a dollar worth, slightly less than a dollar's worth of advertising from the Russian agency uh, in the regulated period leading up to Brexit. Um, and as I said, we'll, we're, we've continued to cooperate uh, and provide as much information as we can to help the parliamentary committee in its inquiry. Mercedes Bresso, s and in AFCO, please. Thank you. Is the English channel coming through? Can you hear me? Is the English coming through? Good. Is the English coming through now? Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Subsequent to the discovery of the use of Facebook user profiles for political purposes by Cambridge Analytica. Do you think that via electoral rules or other tools it would be possible to begin to control these kinds of practices? I mean, they're extremely dangerous because uh, it's like a pack of wolves that is attacking more fragile subjects, so voters who are more easily persuaded of things. And so uh, it's as if these voters who can be persuaded are being attacked by a band of wolves, as we heard last time. That's a, a metaphor we heard last time. So what do you think that could be done, not only from the private user's point of view, but also from the regulatory point of view, particularly in terms of electoral rules? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think that, that there is a lot we can do, and I think the thing I would say that we first need to do is recognise that no one organisation, be that a regulator, a supplier or a government, is going to solve this. And uh, indeed, if we just attack one bit of it too hard, it's just going to move to a different area and we're going to see people seeking to influence voters through other means. So I think it's really important we look at this in the round. Um, I think the real trick to good regulation is having really powerful data controls and the GDPR changes we've 
seen and the recent changes to the UK government uh, for the ICO have been really positive in that respect. We then need our ability to regulate uh, the elections. So some of the things we would like to see is enhanced powers for the Electoral Commission to seek information from just beyond immediate campaigners. So to be able to, to request information from suppliers, uh, slightly stronger powers to obtain data and enter premises, although we have um, quite good ones there already. And then the ability to stop people doing things if we think it is breaking the law, uh, supported by stronger fines. None of that is very exciting. And none of that is a big, brave new world. But actually, this isn't, that's, I don't think that's what's needed. I think what we need here is social media companies taking responsibility for playing their part accurately and then regulators with the powers that they need to enforce that and to sanction breaches to that if they happen and that's what we're calling for. Cornelia Ernst for GUI and ITRI, please. Uh, ja, vielen Dank. Ich werde in Deutsch sprechen. Yes, thank you very much. I'll be speaking in German. We've heard a great deal about what you've done from Facebook's side, and it's very interesting to hear what our British colleague had to say. And it poses the question for me, how do you make a difference between general advertisements for products as advertisements from advertisements which, uh, which are political advertisements? So how do you do that? What's different? After all, you have uh, advertisements when there is elections, and there's there's special rules for that about proportionality. So if you have electoral advertisements. So that leads to the question of manipulation. We've been talking about all this time. What I'd like to know from you, well, you can say, oh, it's this kind of manipulation, it's fake news. But if we put that aside, what is what do you see as uh, electoral manipulation? How do you recognize it? What exactly, how exactly do you, do, you, do you see it? What do you see it as being? Well, there, there were a couple of different points that you made in your question. Um, the first was the question about how do you tell the difference between uh, commercial advertisements and political advertisements and, and how, do you, how differently do you treat them? Uh, one of the things we've done, and I mentioned this uh, in my opening statement, is to develop the view ads tool which actually treats all advertisements the same. And uh, it's based on the belief that anybody should be able to see all of the ads that, a, that an advertiser is running. One of the things people worry about uh, on, on uh, social media is the ability to micro-target certain populations um, without the rest of the electorate knowing that that's happening. We've decided to address that through the View Ads tool uh, and ensure that everybody can essentially play the role of political watchdog and know exactly what any page or political actor uh, is showing in terms of advertising to anyone in the country. So we think that kind of transparency is going to contribute tremendously uh, to the ability of people to hold uh, political actors accountable for the ads that they're running and the way that they're trying to target different elements of the population. In terms of uh, what we consider electoral manipulation, we focus on the things that we can actually see and define, uh, things like misinformation, like clickbait or sensationalism. Uh, we have to focus on the actions that are taking place on our platform that we can identify and then take action against those. Um, I've laid out the, the host of different ways in which we're trying to combat different types of uh, exploitation or manipulation or misinformation or foreign interference and we just have to keep going through each of those and when we see a behavior uh, that we think is inauthentic um, or is trying to mislead to take appropriate action against it. The next TVP speaker is not here so I'll go to Pedro Silva Pereira for the SND in AFCO. Yes, thank you very much uh, for Mr. Kaplan. Um, you mentioned um, some of the most sophisticated ways of misuse of Facebook um, for political purposes, namely uh, foreign interference, uh, use of uh, fake accounts or um, unreliable websites. Um, I would like to ask you about uh, less, less sophisticated ways of uh, misusing your platform for political purposes. 
uh, ways of spreading uh, false information and black political campaigns through those uh, anonymous commentaries that we see um, uh, in a daily basis uh, everywhere. Can this be uh, properly uh, addressed without a mandatory and reliable digital ID register? And uh, is that technically possible in the near future? Thank you. Um, again, uh, we have a number of ways uh, that, we're, that we're attacking the spread of misinformation uh, surrounding election campaigns. Uh, we've talked about them here today a number of times, going after the fake accounts, attacking the financial motivation and trying to remove the incentive for those actors uh, to engage in that activity on Facebook, working with independent third-party fact-checkers uh, who can assess the, the truth or falsity of a statement. We don't think it's appropriate for Facebook to be the arbiter of truth in countries all over the world, um, so we rely on independent third-party fact-checkers who have been accredited uh, for that purpose. Um, and then we can take the action to reduce its distribution. We're also reducing the distribution of other types of low quality content that is often associated um, with, with that type of activity, clickbait, sensationalism. We know people don't want to see that, so we're reducing its distribution in, our news, in the news feed. Uh, and we're trying to, and we're trying to, to uh, promote the sharing and distribution of trusted news. So news that's from in, uh, sources that people on Facebook broadly find to be trusted, uh, news that's informative, news that comes from local sources. Uh, those are the types of things we're trying to promote. Uh, as you point out, um, this is, again, this is a battle that all of us are going to have to continue to, f to fight. Um, there's a real role for government in helping to educate the citizenry uh, about the information they see online. Um, and, and we're going to continue to play our part both in reducing its distribution, um, as well as trying to educate people uh, on our platform and off about how they can spot false news and be critical consumers of news. Jared Batten for the EFTD and Libe. Thank please. you, Claude. Uh, well, of course, if, if Remain had won the referendum and if Hillary Clinton had won the presidency in the United States, none of us would be sitting here today and discussing this. It just wouldn't be an issue. But we are. So I've got a, a question for Claire Bassett of the Electoral Commission. Uh, Ms. Bassett said that, the, you know, we described how the Commission's role was to uh, enforce the rules on funding and to ensure that donors were permissible. Well, there were two campaigners in the referendum campaign that I'd like to ask about who actually used more traditional methods. First of all, Her Majesty's Government spent almost £10 million on a booklet that went to every household that only gave one side of the argument, and that was the Remain side. Now, were the government permissible donors, uh, and was their donation <laughs> registered? And secondly, regarding foreign interference in the referendum, President Obama made a special visit to the UK in order to directly influence the outcome of the referendum for the Remain side. Were the many millions of dollars that were spent on that visit, visit registered as a notional donation? And how could President Obama possibly be, possibly be a permissible donor? Uh, so if I take the first of those first, the booklet that the government produced was produced before the 10-week uh, spending period. So uh, that wasn't required to be reported in spending returns. Um, we did, before the rule, in, as the rules were progressing through Parliament, uh, make the case for a longer uh, campaign period uh, that would have covered activity like that. But in the instance of that referendum, that activity took place prior to commencement of that campaign period um, and we did monitor all of the activity that took place during the campaign period including significant events such that and they were correctly reported. Molly Scott Cato from the Greens. Thank you very much Claude. My question is also for Claire Bassett. I understand that you have concluded your report into the possible illegal collusion between the official Leave campaign vote Leave during the EU referendum, but that has been sent to those named in it so that they can comment on the way their testimony has been included. For the sake of some members of the committee here, I should note that those people may include the British Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson and the Environment Secretary Michael Gove. Obviously, this inquiry is of vital importance. Since if spending rules were broken, it undermines the validity of the mandate for the UK to leave the EU. 
Please, could you confirm whether the report is complete and whether it's when it's likely to be made public? And what can you do about the apparent spinning through pre-publication leaks by some of the people involved? Clearly, it needs to be part of the public debate. We need to have the full information in your report well before the UK goes ahead with its decision to leave the EU on the basis of what may turn out to have been an insecure mandate. Uh, just to explain, uh, we have an enforcement policy which sets out very clearly how we approach both undertaking investigations and the conclusion of investigations. As part of that process, once we have reached the point where we are minded to make a particular decision, uh, the details of that are shared with the affected party and they have 28 days uh, within which they can make representations. Uh, that We then consider those reputations before coming to our conclusions. It's only when we reach those conclusions that we make that public and we share our more detailed investigation reports uh, publicly as part of that. Um, we do not comment on ongoing investigations. It's a very clear policy of the Electoral Commission. I think it is the right one because it stops us getting drawn into a very difficult and fevered debate. Um, it is deeply regrettable that uh, there have been rumours flying about around that, uh, some of which you know, I do not know where they came from, particularly with dates in mind. As I've said, I've outlined that process. We're, we're in that process and we're during the 28 days at the moment. Could I use the additional minute? Just, no. I mean, you've started to go on. Oh, thank you. Can so, um, I'm I mean, still in my time. On. So, you said you don't have the powers to investigate Cambridge Analytica, but if that's the case, then who does? Do you feel you have the, the powers that you need to stop this sort of subversion of our electoral process, real or potential, by foreign powers? If not, which further powers do you think you need, and which other organisations can take up some of the matters raised by people here, which you've admitted you don't have sufficient powers to undertake? What I've been is very clear about what our remit is and what the powers we have. The, the Information Commissioner's Office uh, has a separate remit and the powers that she needs within that to do that. So a lot of the things that we've heard about here today are about breaches of data protection rule, uh, rules and that investigation is ongoing and I understand due to report very soon. So I think you know, we need to be very clear this isn't about an absence of powers for the Electoral Commission that's a failing. This is about having different regulators in different spaces working together to address incredibly serious matters. Um, as I've said, our investigations look at where the money has come from and where that's been funded. We do have ongoing investigations into that, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment. Okay, thank you. I, I've allowed some supplementaries, which I'm not allowed to do, but it's almost inhuman to not do that, so hang me, you know, whatever. It's just so boring to, to <laughs> stick to that rule, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, well, at least we're doing question and answer, that's an improvement. Um, I really want to thank um, our witnesses, speakers, um, Joe Kaplan and uh, Claire um, Bassett. And thank you to the members for their patience and discipline. We're going to move straight to session three. I know it's a long session, we've got members coming in. So could I just mention that in the, in the next session, um, we would start at 18.15, just to allow members who have been traveling in and will uh, be answer, answering questions to, to get here. Um, so it allows us a, just a short break um, for, the, for the panel to be assembled. That will be Lord, um, Lord Allen, Max Schrems, Ursula Pacho and Steve Purser. Um, and, the, and the chair will be Joseph Weidenholzer for this the next session. So colleagues. Well, and th thank you to our AFCO oh, yeah, chair, Danuta Hubner, very much. Thank you, Danuta. Thank you. Well, media trained, trained, um, uh, and exactly like I said, if, if we may have won, we wouldn't even be sitting. No one would be interested. No, of course not. It's only because that was obviously going against the right.
So, good, uh, good afternoon. I welcome you to the, the last, last part of our hearing today. Uh, it is together with ITRE, and I also welcome uh, my colleague Paul Rubik. Uh, he has the floor for uh, uh, two minutes. Uh, before I give him, uh, give him the floor, I, I want to introduce the, the panel. Mr. Persa, Head of Operational Department at NISA, Ursula Pachl, Deputy General, Director General at BOIC, Mark Schrems, a privacy activist and lawyer from Austria, and Lord Richard Allen, Vice President of Policy Solution Facebook. Give the floor to you, Paul. Yes, many thanks. Uh, uh, my colleague uh, Joe Weidenholz uh, is uh, very good in timing, and so I try to be short. I'm a member of uh, ITRE committee and of STOA. STOA is the Scientific Technology Options Assessment of the European Parliament. Uh, and STOA is in charge of the legislative part of uh, research. So therefore, for us, it's quite important to see uh, how trust instruments uh, could be uh, in a stronger quality. Uh, up till now, uh, 
our devices more or less uh, do whatever third parties want uh, to do them. And uh, our question is how can we improve uh, the power of the consumers uh, to have uh, their own identity guaranteed? So the question is which uh, guarantee do we get on our virtual identity? Uh, because uh, as we know, it's, it's very easy uh, to fake identities. And uh, if you fake my identity, the question is uh, how I can keep the ownership on my data and how I can uh, get uh, fake news out of uh, uh, social media uh, to have a guarantee that my uh, virtual identity is given, uh, that I have the ownership on my identity, that I have the ownership on my uh, uh, activities, and that I can give a license to a third party uh, which want to use uh, my identity or want to use uh, 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 my knowledge. So uh, what can we do against an avatar in the system? Because we know that avatars can copy identities one to one. And uh, the next step will be, could we get a trusted uh, unit within European Union to have a guarantee on our, on our virtual identity? Thank you. Our first speaker is now Mr. Steve Purser. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good, uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting us to talk tonight. But at the risk of disappointing you, we are mainly in listening mode here tonight um, because, and certainly after listening to the debate this evening, uh, it struck me just how little of the issues you are discussing in this forum are in the Inessa Work Programme. And that is a message in itself, because these are important things. And honestly, most of the things, most of the discussions I've been witness to the, this afternoon, Inessa is not really involved at all. So this, I think, is something we need to change in the future. And this is a message from me to you, people who can change the Inessa Work Programme, uh, about an evolution we could, we could make happen quite fast. But I'll, I'll make a few comments anyway, and I'll certainly be here for questions. Um, so let's start with the positive. I mean, the internet and social media have certainly provided new opportunities for spreading democracy, freedom, and the values embraced by the EU. And I think we shouldn't forget that in this debate, because the worst thing that could possibly happen is that we put in place a series of controls which puts a break on this. This is a very positive evolution in the last 10 years. If you think about it, social media played an important role in the Arab Spring, 2011, in the Ukraine in 2014, Iran in 2009. And I think in each case, um, the message was that the word is more powerful than the sword. And again, I think this is hugely advantageous to what we're trying to achieve in Europe. But of course, what we are seeing now is in addition to all these old threats which we've known for many, many years, we're seeing a new sort of genre of threat, if you like, um, which is even more threatening in some ways than the traditional uh, virus attacks, uh, malicious code, etc., which at least were quite straightforward, and when you got hit by one, you knew it. We are now looking at things like fake news, abusive use of personal data, financial manipulation, think of pump and dump and these kind of things uh, you probably heard a lot about not long ago. Uh, in addition to all these traditional risks, I think the distinguishing factor between the two is these are very subtle risks and half the time you don't even know that you are falling prey to them. So this is a really big danger for the digital world because it's affecting trust and the digital world without trust is a digital world that may not survive at all. And even if it does survive, it may not survive in the form in which it's useful to ourselves. So it's a huge threat, I think. Um, but talking of trust, of course, trust is, is, not a, is not sufficient alone. It's certainly necessary, but definitely not sufficient. So that's where cybersecurity comes in, and that's where ANISA plays a role. Cybersecurity, if you like, is all those techniques which we use to limit access to data according to a well-defined set of principles. And that those principles, of course, can vary from occasion to occasion and from context to context. And that's part of what makes security difficult. Context is enormously uh, um, important in security. And taking account of it, uh, certainly in an algorithmic way, is extremely difficult. 
Now, in some circumstances, cybersecurity can also limit how data is used. But the bad news is that once you take the data out of the context of the system that was designed to process it, it's a bit game over. Once the data is out, it's out. And then, of course, you can do anything with it. And this is a bit the history of, of uh, Cambridge Analytica and, and, to some extent, what's happening with, with all our data more and more as time progresses. So I would say one of the biggest problems we have at the moment is that the collection and subsequent sharing of data on the Internet is widespread, almost difficult to control and almost unchallenged. And this has to change. Because, again, I repeat, once the data is out there, it's out, and it's inherently difficult to control it. Of course, GDPR does not allow for processing of personal data without consent. But how do you enforce this when you don't even know what's happening? This, of course, is the, the key of the problem we're discussing today. So coming back to security, all security is actually a combination of three things. It's people, it's process, and it's technology. And I would say, in general, one of the mistakes we've made in the past and we're still making today is we place far too much emphasis on, te on technology. If you think about it, a lot of the things we've been discussing today are essentially process-oriented and people-oriented. So what we saw, really, was um, a, a process failure in which a company was allowed to get too much access to data and to use it inappropriately. Uh, it, it's also a violation of policy. I mean, what's the use of having a policy if you're not enforcing it? And I can well accept the argument that it's tremendously difficult to enforce a policy with so many users. But that's it. That's life. It's a big company. It's a very rich company. And we have to change. It's as simple as that. I think one of the messages of, of things we're seeing at the moment is the, the balance between opportunity and risk will have to change. But not that much. Okay, so we may not be able to control things like the Internet of Things to the, to the extent that we can control things today. But nevertheless, there is a duty of care in all this. And setting up appropriate and scalable processes is part of that duty of care. So, coming back to where I started from, this was not only a breach of process and a breach of policy, it was, of course, a breach of trust. And that could be the death sentence of the Internet as we know it, unless we find a way of dealing with it. So, Anissa, of course, is a big supporter of the GDPR. We believe it's a, a very ambitious, very important, and, and, and hopefully... Uh, an extremely useful piece of legislation. It certainly looks like it's going to be that way. We are fully in the service of the GDPR. We're listening to you in how we can do more to support the GDPR. Um, and I, again, I repeat this message that um, the world is changing. The kind of problems that we are dealing with at the moment are not the kind of problems that Anissa was, was created to deal with, but that doesn't mean to say we can't evolve to deal with them. Of course we can. So things like election hacking, fake news, um, as we say, use of uh, digital identities, etc., etc. These are all things that Anissa can do. You have the power to change this. Um, you're one of the most influent players. And even at a small layer, let me close by saying that um, there is a thing in the Anissa regulation called Article 14, which enables EU institutions uh, and member states to make special requests to Anissa for p specific tasks. So please make use of it. Yeah? This is a great um, mechanism for doing something at short notice, which is very powerful. So I think with there, I'll end my intervention. And again, thank you for inviting me tonight. Yes, many thanks to you. And our next speaker is Ursula Bache. She is Deputy Director, of General, De uh, Deputy Director General from BIC. It's uh, the European Consumer Organization. So please. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good evening. Uh, everybody. Let me first start that um, say that it's clear that everything that this scandal is uncovering, so the Facebook um, and, and Cambridge Analytical scandal is uncovering, has and should have major consequences when it comes to consumer trust. This scandal is affecting consumer trust not only regarding Facebook, but it's trust regarding the whole architecture of the digital economy. And this is the perspective that we should take when we look at the situation. The way that it works now is that the exploitation of data is the primary source of revenue on the Internet. And there is no doubt that it is not only Facebook where data abuses can happen, but it's across all platforms 
and across the internet. So the general feeling of consumers and consumer advocates is that the transparency we need isn't there on platforms and that our data protection and privacy rights are most of the time or often not respected. Secondly, I would also like to highlight that it's not only a matter of trust and apologies, it is much more than that. It's our fundamental rights that are not being respected. And the practices portrayed in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal are not on breach of trust only. They are about illegality. So on the Facebook case, according to the official communication by Facebook, 2.7 million Europeans have been affected. I have to say I was a bit surprised by uh, the statements that we heard today that Dr. Coden did not share these data so that Europeans are not affected. This is a contradiction. I don't know how it can be explained. It reminded me a little bit of Volkswagen that uh, explained that, I mean, that apologized and that later on said everything is anyhow legal. So these data were siphoned without consumers' knowledge or informed consent and then sold to others and uh, used for a complete different purpose that the one, than the one that was initially established. And we are talking about the case of Cambridge Analytica, but we know in the meantime has been also uh, confirmed today by Facebook that they have already suspended over 200 applications for potential data misuse. So we are only looking at the tip of the iceberg, as it is always said. So if you're a user of Facebook, you can be quite sure that your data has been misused at a certain point of time by somebody. And even if you're not a Facebook user, your data probably have been affected. So for a long time, Facebook has been careless, carelessly giving access to third parties to its users' data. And when it came to its knowledge that some people might be misusing that data, Facebook failed to take all the necessary measures to correct the situation. The company's response until now is far from satisfactory. An apology tour and some cosmetic changes on the platform, and that is not good enough in our opinion. Um, we have seen some changes in Facebook's privacy policy that may have been uh, portrayed as a direct reaction to the scandal, but in Europe at least most of them were purely GDR compliance uh, changes, and let me say at this uh, occasion that we also have serious doubts about the JDR, JDPR compliance of the current uh, Facebook privacy policy. So what do we need to fix all this? What we need is uh, not only cosmetic changes, we need substantial modifications that would affect the core business model of Facebook and the structure of the platform. And by extensions, extension, the same can be said for the core business model and monetization structure of the internet. As long as commercial surveillance and surveillance-based advertising remain the bread and butter of the digital economy, it will be very hard to trust these companies for consumers because there is an inherent conflict of interest. Now, how do consumers feel about this? Our member, Witch, in the UK, did a very interesting study recently about the future of consumer data, and it showed that there is a widespread sense of disempowerment amongst consumers. People are unsure about the impact that the use of data by these platforms has on them and whether it is worth trying or whether it is possible at all to take any action about the negative practices that concern them. They feel particularly disempowered because their own behavior may inadvertently cause them harm. And studies show that in such circumstances, consumers, they just give up. So people have a lot of questions, but they still use Facebook. So many say people anyhow, they don't care. But the reason in our opinion is not that they don't care. The reasons are resignation, disempowerment, and the lack of competition and alternatives. So as you know, there is no mainstream substitute for Facebook on the market today. Of course, the scandal has also been an eye-opener for many, and it raises consumer awareness, which is very good. One point uh, that is a bit surprising in the whole discussion um, is that in the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook scandal, very few attention has been given to consumers' harm and the damage that consumers have uh, suffered. It has been their data that has been misused, so they are the first victims here. And this is why today our Belgian, Italian, Spanish and Portuguese members, consumer organizations in these countries, 
so that's Testasha, Altro Consumo, Ocon, Deco. They have launched a group action, a collective redress action today against Facebook. Well, today it has only been Belgium, but the others will follow in the next uh, few uh, days. And they have asked compensation from Belgium. In Belgium, uh, from Facebook, sorry, in Belgium it was already 20,000 people who have signed up to this uh, action. And it, they ask for compensation not only for those affected by Cambridge Analytica, but they have asked to represent all Facebook users because of the reasons that I just explained. Uh, a quick word on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is very closely related, of course, to privacy. The data that you have, they need to be, uh, that you use, they need to be safe, and they should not be, um, uh, they should be safe from unwanted intrusions. Uh, and you cannot trust a service if, if you know that it's not secure. But I think we should not get deviated here. It's very clear that the case of uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica was not a cybersecurity problem. It was just that Facebook op was opening its doors to uh, third parties to take uh, the data. Now, the question is what time, uh, what time, what kind of um, uh, obligations do we have to ensure security? Let me first say that what we know from consumer research is that uh, the things that I said about consumer resignation, they also apply to security breaches. Our members' research shows that consumers do not understand what happens to breach data. And an important point in this is that there is no assistance from companies or governments to help them find out if their data has not only been stolen, but also may be sold or otherwise publicly exposed. So once the data are out, uh, they are out and you don't get any idea what has happened to these data once there is a breach and consumers are really left alone in this situation. At the same time, we know that connected products will be in our households everywhere very soon. And we know that they don't, do not only spy on you, but they can also be very easily hacked. And I have to make the point here that unfortunately the European Commission really missed the opportunity to put forward binding legislation. The Cybersecurity Act that some of you may be involved with is only a voluntary um, proposes only voluntary measures uh, and does not oblige that there should be security by design and by default built in into connected products, for example. That is regret regrettable because we know, uh, I think by now, that we cannot simply rely on self-regulation and um, the apparent goodwill of, that, of these companies. We need robust legislation. So coming to the conclusions, um, let me... Um, Say a few uh, points. First of all, consumers need further support to rebalance power over the use of their data. We have the GDPR, that's a very good point. We will hopefully have the e-privacy directive, but we need more measures. We firmly believe that the GDPR will have a very positive impact, but we really need the enforcement of it. And I would come back to uh, what Mrs. Jelinek explained about the consistency mechanism, because we need European answers to these big companies and the infringements that they do on a European, if not global, scale. In relation to Facebook, I think that it's really necessary not only to look at the Cambridge Analytica scandal, but really to do a major investigation also including the current Facebook privacy practices. And this would allow also to rely on the new GDPR rules and to do a consistency decision which would have a European impact. The European Commission should conduct a market study into the digital advertising markets. We have already asked for that in the high level group on fake news that the European Commission established, but our demand did not get through. Compensation of consumers for the misuse of their personal data should be self-understood. And I would like to mention that we have a proposal for collective redress on the new consumer deal on the table that we ask you to support. I'm nearly done. Um, last point, we need stronger measures to ensure platform accountability for third-party access to data. We have seen that Facebook apparently had no meaningful process in place beyond its terms and conditions to monitor and enforce use of that data in line with the terms and conditions. We've heard them saying today that, okay, they have their policy, but Cambridge had another policy. Well, what should we do about that? So we need more accountability in that respect. And my final point is that consumer organizations will contrib contribute with complaints and legal action
but we need collective redress across the European Union and we also need a strong civil society in all member states and that is not a given for the time being, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Our next speaker now is Max Schrems. Um, hello, thanks a lot for the invitation. I got to say I was very, very much looking forward to this invitation. I think it's the time at the European Parliament that is the most interesting. Um, if we talk about consequences, I think we do have a problem in trust in Facebook, in, in the authorities in this case, and um, in digitalization as a whole if we don't get it right. Um, the reason why I was looking forward to this that much is um, we knew about all of this in 2011 already. Um, we went through all of this, and it's especially interesting that Richard Allen is on this panel now because in 2011 we debated the problems with apps in person over and over again for seven hours it was part of that in a meeting in, in, in Vienna. Um, to have this debate now is kind of absurd. If seven years later we now finally figure out that there was a problem, then I wonder who was sleeping that long. I guess it was someone at Facebook and at the authorities. And to walk you through this, um, I kind of brought, to, I probably should first explain what actually happened. Um, so we have Facebook. They sent data as Facebook Ireland to um, an app that was at the time, to my understanding, in the UK. So the sending act by Facebook is relevant for GDPR for the, direct, uh, for the directive before. And the question is, what, was that even legal? And back then we filed a complaint in 2011. I brought it with me. It's three pages. And it said there was no consent and there was no way of Facebook to ever control what this app does with the data. That was exactly the two points that later turned out in Cambridge Analytica to be exactly the problem. That's, it's exactly the two points that I didn't know that five years ago, earlier but it turned out to be a problem. Um, at the time, there were 20 million installs per day, according to Facebook. So the debate about, oh, there was just one app and they didn't use European data is simply wrong. There were 20 million installs and some other, other data sets will have done that. To give you an example, I, we programmed an app to sue Facebook in a class section. I got 25,000 data sets from Facebook, never did anything illegal with it, but they're on my computer and I could have done something else. No one ever asked me at Facebook site, what I did with that data. I could have sold them to someone. No one would have ever figured that out. So we now know about one app, but there may be thousands of other apps that did similar things. Um, so we basically went forward with that. That was a violation at the time of Article 6, 7, 10, 17, and 25 of the directive. All of them were listed. The consequence of all of this was that we had an audit report in 2011, which I brought as well. There were a couple of pages on apps. And the Irish Data Protection Commissioner didn't decide over Article 6, 6, 7, and so on, but they made recommendations about having a nicer privacy policy, about having a nicer button, about, for example, checking that links to privacy policies of apps were dead links that led nowhere, not to a privacy policy, but to an empty page. That was the recommendations at the time, but they've never really thought about the legal basis for this transfer operation, nothing of the actual law that's foreseen here. Um, Basically, Facebook said that they rely on their, um, on their agreement, that there's now a team that reviews all of that in 2011 already, but it didn't figure out Cambridge Analytica, um, that there is a graduate response to problem, and that basically sharing this data without consent is part of what they, that's a quote, call a social dimension of their platform. To not ask anybody else to share your data is a social dimension of a platform. Wonderful news speak. Um, the DPC at the time said that they, Facebook could significantly improve, that um, the privacy policies will be fixed, and they do not think that um, reliance on the apps itself is sufficient. So the DPC at the time identified the problem that these apps may share the data with someone else. That was in 2011, December. We had then a meeting with Richard Allen back there. In 2012, there's actually a protocol of this meeting. And at the time, Richard, who sent that back, um, mentioned that um, they think that there is general consent so by using Facebook, you consent that someone else may send your data to some app you've never heard of, and that may send it onward to someone you even don't have ever thought of. And that is what they considered specific and informed consent at the time, which I would say was not really up to code. Um, the interesting thing from that was that there was also talk about so-called third-party consent. So someone else consented on behalf of me that this app gets my data, which is a very interesting construct that we don't know even since Roman law. Um, but there's now third-party consent, apparently. Um, and 
they basically said that these apps are regulated by the law. So if the app is in North Korea, it's apparently regulated by North Korean law, and it's not promo Facebook then if the data goes there. And um, that the user has to ensure that these apps follow the law, which is interesting how, like, a grandma that's 80 years old that uses an app should figure out if they really follow the law or not. Following all of this, there was a re-audit right here. You can download all this online as well. And at the time, that was in 2012, um, the DPC, actually, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, said that Facebook should um, revisit that problem and figure out the solution to it. That was in 2012, so six years ago. And um, Facebook answered to that that it now relies on reporting by users. So they relied on someone of its users to figure out that Cambridge Analytica goes on and to report it to them, which is not probably the best security situation you could possibly have. Um, I think this shows a couple of things. First of all, that this was a violent, an obvious violation of the law we had at the time. I don't think that Facebook does much different today. They changed this product, but other products are pretty much the same. We see that the authorities in this case look the other way. This whole procedure was taken back by me after three years because the Irish Data Protection Commissioner didn't even give me the written responses from Facebook. We're basically locked out of the own procedure. After three years, I took it back because it was basically unenforceable, these rights that you have under the law. Um, I think the interesting thing is not going to be if this changes with GDPR. If GDPR and the 4% make decision processes of Facebook that different that they fear it. If you read the privacy policy and what you heard before, for example, that, for example, making money from your data is a legitimate interest, which basically is using data for advertisement, for example, in the, in the WhatsApp question that I think Jan Philip Abrecht posted before, then I wonder if they really follow even the spirit of GDPR, let alone the letter of the law. Um, but this will come down, and we'll see if the authorities actually enforce that. In the long run, I think the interesting thing is also going to be if we have um, users to enforce their rights. That's going to be a cost issue, because even if I go to DPA, the appeal is still going to be, in this case, for example, in Ireland oftentimes, which costs millions of euros. For example, the case we have right now pending against Facebook, we tax around 10 million euros in legal costs for whoever loses the case. Um, so you may have your rights on paper, but the enforceability of it is another question. Um, finally, and I think that is a general question, is we'll need to have funding for enforcement by the net member states, but probably also on the European level, to fund enforcement by BOIC, by other organizations to do enforce these issues, because bringing a case like that ruins an average NGO. And that is a fundamental problem we have. We have rights on paper, but the enforcement is basically not payable. And that was my general rage about um, GDPR, privacy, and the enforceability. A whole different chapter I think I want to open as well is the question of open networks. We fundamentally have market failure. We have a lot of people that hate Facebook, but they don't have any other option. And something that Europe did quite well is opening up networks, be it telephone, gas, electricity, I don't know what. And it's something that is interestingly supported by all different political groups. But we don't open up online networks right now. I think in the long run to actually have pressure and to have the market do its job here, We'll also have to debate this thing, and that may be a solution that we do have trust in the long run for, uh, for consumers and also the different options for consumers so that companies will actually have to follow that. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, our next spe uh, speaker is Lord Richard Allen. Uh, he's since 2009 uh, with Facebook as Director of Policy Europe, so he knows in detail. Uh, Allen, please. Thank you very much, Chad. I'm uh, also delighted to be here and delighted to uh, share the panel with, with Max. Um, you'll not be surprised to hear that I have a slightly different version of events, which is of a company that um, listened to criticism, was open to meeting with critics, uh, and actually uh, I saw a process that worked quite effectively where regulators did get involved. Uh, these questions of law were tested, um, but we're left with different assessments of uh, how the law should be applied, and that actually is a truism for data protection law generally, that um, there are often different opinions of concepts like consent and so on, and many of those I'm sure will be tested with Max's good offices over uh, coming months and years. Uh, in talking about cybersecurity and consumer protection, I wanted to build actually on a question that was asked in the last session about responsibility and broaden this out a little, if I may. There are 
uh, of course, some very significant issues we're debating related to data protection, but many of the issues related to consumer trust that we experience and that we work with at a European level uh, are broader than that and particularly relate uh, to harmful activities through our platform. Uh, in terms of dealing with those, the first line of defense is preventing, preventing uh, people with bad intent from accessing our services, and you heard earlier uh, from my colleagues about how we deal with fake accounts. But just to put that in context, most services on the Internet will have rules for who can and cannot register. For example, they may prohibit multiple accounts or they may ban so-called bots that are operated through automation that, rather than by a person. Uh, Facebook's terms have this additional requirement that people must use their authentic identity. And this is a key part of the characteristics of the Facebook service where people come to share with their real family and friends. And I was interested, again, in questions earlier about the extent to which services should demand proof of identity, which I think itself is a, a controversial uh, issue in the context of discussions around data protection, but is certainly uh, worth exploring. So again, as colleagues referred to earlier, we uh, invest heavily in detecting and preventing registrations that, that breach those rules, and we describe some of those methods. But as well as the standard methods, which is looking at you know, multiple registrations from a particular country that we know is high risk, uh, we also face some very sophisticated attackers. And this is where uh, companies like ours employ world-leading uh, cybersecurity uh, experts to investigate those forms of attack. Um, this is necessarily something that we tend not to talk about in detail publicly because we don't want to tip off uh, the attackers, but you can look at the experience of the Internet Research Agency in the United States, uh, which is now in the public domain, and you can see that they created over a long period of time realistic-looking accounts in order to carry out their misinformation campaigns. Now that we understand what they were doing, we have a signature for that attack, uh, and we'll build that into our uh, future election protection requirements. And again, there was a question earlier, I think, about uh, Hungarian elections. What I can say is, for every election now, we look at the signatures of different kinds of attacks historically uh, and try and prevent those uh, from happening again. As well as fake accounts, we also work hard to prevent the scraping of data. So this is where people try and access data from public uh, uh, pages. So certain amounts of Facebook data may be public, and individuals may try and scrape that data and build a database uh, from it. Um, and we use various signals, including uh, logs of access, in order to try and uh, prevent that. And finally, in the context of the Cambridge Analytica issue, uh, we do, uh, exactly as has been described, want to prevent people who gain legitimate access, uh, for example, by creating an app and then use the data for illegitimate purposes. Uh, and I, I don't agree that the changes are, are cosmetic. Actually, I think they're quite uh, profound. Uh, the app ecosystem that we built up was with a genuine intent that where uh, people want to create social applications or where individuals want to use social applications, we should make that easy. It turns out that that ease of use uh, has risks with it, and we are now uh, trying to reduce the risks, and that does mean reducing access. I mean, physically uh, reducing the way in which people can access that data. Um, turning to the other areas where we feel we need to demonstrate responsibility, uh, a lot of those involve automated and human review of activity that takes place on our platform that's problematic. Uh, the most advanced area in this field is child sexual exploitation, which uh, remains a major issue for people. Um, and there we've developed techniques over many years to block abusive material, to stop it getting on in the first place. This is relatively straightforward, as that material is always illegal. Uh, there is no question uh, if it's being posted. There's no way to post it legally. We remove it. And we work closely with the European Commission on this, especially with uh, former Commissioner Neely Cruz, who, who led a very important cross-industry initiative. We're now using uh, similar techniques against terrorist propaganda material, working with other industry partners and with Commissioners Avramopoulos and King within the EU Internet Forum, uh, and I think we're making more progress there than anyone believed was possible, where we are uh, now able to identify a lot of ISIS and al-Qaeda terrorist content um, before anyone reports it to us, and ideally before anyone sees it, so we can take that down before it's distributed across our platform. And again, we, we feel these kind of initiatives are essential for trust, that people see our services as contributing to public good, not public harm. Uh, the other areas that, that we're focused on are around hate speech with uh, Commissioner Jourova, uh, where this is more complex because you need to understand irony and other uh, issues related to that content. Um, but again, I think we're making uh, progress there. And then finally, the other subject we've talked about a lot today, which is false news. 
Uh, I myself was on the expert group, and we're now taking part in the work uh, led by Commissioner Gabrielle. Uh, again, I would say this is, in a sense, the most complex area because one person's uh, fake news is another person's political speech. We have to acknowledge that. And there are some real challenges around uh, how we arrive at definitions. Um, there's some interesting initiatives like the uh, French move towards legislating in this area that uh, I think will be very instructive. But again, answering and solving the false news problem uh, we believe is essential for, for user trust. Um, and the final area that people are focused on is, uh, I know in this parliament, is around intellectual property. Again, uh, making sure our platforms are not used to distribute uh, intellectual property uh, illegally is a, a key thing that we need to do and that we're working on. Uh, the final area I wanted to touch on was just around advertising. Um, and advertising has been discussed a lot. As we've said previously, we believe that online advertising is a widely accepted and acceptable way to fund many online services, including ours. It offers a way for uh, small and medium businesses in particular to reach customers they could not have reached before because the barriers were too high. Uh, and it supports the fact that people can access services for free. Uh, um, and that does enable very broad access. We often talk about a digital divide. Uh, the fact that so many very high quality online services are free at the point of use uh, actually reduces the digital divide and is essential, we believe, for broader access. But we also recognize it can be abused, and we do place additional requirements on advertisers that are not there for other users. Um, so, for example, for advertising, there are higher content standards, if you like, than there would be generally. Anything that's generally forbidden is not allowed in advertising, but there's also some content that may be acceptable in private communication that would not be acceptable uh, as an advert. Um, we also need to collect uh, payment information for ads, and this means collecting credit card information, which a normal user wouldn't have to provide, um, and we're able to check this to try and prevent fraud. We also work uh, in Europe with the European uh, Consumer Protection Agencies, um, and we set up dedicated points of contact so they can re report to us, for example, inappropriate uh, uh, ads, um, ads that are trying to sell fraudulent products. And we have a relationship with a number of the self-regulatory bodies for advertising, uh, so we can also get reports from them. Um, it's certainly not in our interest, and certainly in, from the point of view of consumer trust, uh, to have poor quality or misleading ads shown on our system. And we welcome the partnerships we built to tackle this. Um, finally, a, a key part of the toolkit is making advertising more transparent, and my colleagues earlier explained how we're doing this. Uh, we believe this transparency will help any watchdog, whether in the political field or in the broader consumer protection area, to identify ads of concern to them and, and flag them for uh, action. I hope that's a useful introduction to some of the key areas that we're focused on related to cybersecurity, uh, consumer protection and trust. I think it does raise some very interesting questions. Uh, we know, for example, that some people object to our authentic identity policy, um, but we believe it's key to preventing a number of harms that people also want to tackle. We know there are concerns about the automated processing of data uh, to remove inappropriate content. At the same time, uh, politicians who have visited uh, one of our review centers in Berlin have said to us, how can we make it so that reviewers no longer have to look at awful content like uh, child abuse material or terrorist content and clearly automated uh, means that humans may not need to look at that content. And there are some very big questions about the misuse of ads, especially in the political arena, but at the same time, we do, I think, want communication to be easy and cheap uh, for legitimate businesses. I look forward to discussing uh, these and the broader range of questions uh, uh, now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming now to the questions, as you already know the rules, there's one minute for each question and two minutes for response. Uh, the question should be directed to one person. Uh, and uh, the questions are, are, uh, are actually uh, developed on, on the Tejon system and uh, there would, would have been 14 members, uh, 10 appeared. So I, I'm following the rule uh, as we had agreed upon and I will ask the speakers one after the other. So the first speaker is for EPP, Mr. Radev. Thank you, Chairman. My question is uh, for Lord Tallon. Let us accept that Facebook has and uses tools that guarantee the security of its users. 
that is, it can withstand the cyber attacks. However, as we saw, Facebook does not really have control over the data of its users and forwards to developers and third parties and doesn't know how that data is protected. That's why I would like to ask whether and how Facebook assists the companies and developers that receive Facebook users' data to protect this data from cyber attacks, especially having in mind principles 1 and 3 from the Tech Accord signed by more than 40 companies, including Facebook, in April this year. And something else, does Facebook cut ties with developers and other companies that do not successfully protect the data of Facebook users? Received from Facebook. Thank you. To fa Facebook. <coughs> oh, thanks very much for, for that question. Um, I'd like to answer in, in two parts. So one is sort of more broadly that as an industry, I think we do feel we have a responsibility to help each other. Um, and so in some of the areas I've described, the dynamic we're looking for is that the larger companies, Facebook's one of them, people typically name Google and others, that we do find methods for sharing uh, information and best practice with other companies. And I think we're very clear that something like cybersecurity should not be seen as an area why, where you're trying to gain competitive advantage, but rather you should be trying to protect the whole ecosystem. Uh, and we've uh, put in place tools like uh, we have one called Threat Exchange and others where we are, we are very much trying to share information so we can all stay safe. And to be very clear, if, if other uh, companies have a weakness, that can often affect us and vice versa. Um, so people gain access to one system and then they use that data to then uh, hop across different systems. So we all have an interest in uh, staying secure. The, the second part of the question is, is around a very interesting area, which is what is the responsibility uh, between a first party and a third party where data moves? Um, clearly, as Facebook, following the situation with Cambridge Analytica, we're looking at that in depth, and some of the measures we've taken have been to reduce access, and others are to increase scrutiny, and that's what people expected us to do. Um, but if you think about, you know, we walk around with a phone in our hand, we're all installing applications on a daily basis, uh, and when we install applications, there's a certain amount of data transferring. I think it's a, a really interesting question. I don't think I have the answer to say uh, how much friction should you put in that process, how much should be on the owner of the platform, how much should be on the user, and how much should be on the third party. Um, and I think we should have a very open debate around that. If you say it's all on the first party, then the instinct then is to shut the platform down and people say, well, that's anti-competitive and you're stopping innovation. Um, if the first party takes no responsibility, people are upset about that. And so I think we should have a genuine debate to say, how do we want to share responsibility uh, uh, so that the data is protected, but we don't uh, put too much friction in the place of people trying to do legitimate online activities. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Birgit Sipel. Thank you very much. I will not go into another dispute with a member of Facebook, but I, because I understood that already creating an app in itself gives legitimate access to data, which is crazy and unacceptable if we see what happened in the other area. But I will prefer to ask a question directly to Mrs. Pachel, because many people are using all the digital services without really knowing what is going on and how the data are used, how they process, what is happening with the profiling. And of course they do not know and maybe it's not even possible to find out what is a fake account and how do I deal with that. So coming from that, I would like to know from you, what can we do in addition to hopefully implement all the rules from the data protection regulation do you have an idea to what extent it's necessary to also have e-privacy? Do you think it would help to have more media literacy being presented in schools, youth organizations, or many others? And talking about uh, class action or similar things for your organizations, is there any kind of uh, cooperation with uh, DPOs, data protection uh, organizations, and how does it look like if this is already existing? Thank you. Here. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sipu, for this question. Obviously, that, that's very much on our minds, so what can we do in addition? But let me first be very clear that the GDPR has this principle of privacy by default and by design, and that is really the first thing I think that people need. They need to be uh, put in a position where they know in principle what I use in terms of service should respect my privacy or the predefined configurations of the services that I use, they should give me the most privacy friendly option first of all. So the, the enforcement of these principles and the way that you know the websites present their their choices that consumers can make, I think that's a very important thing that we will very much look into. E-privacy is a very important complementary tool and instrument and protection for consumers because GDPR is not sufficient when it comes about targeting and advertising, so we really need to have a good result on the e-privacy directive. We really call on this house to do its utmost to ensure that. Media literacy is very much important. Uh, awareness raising is absolutely key. We ourselves, our members, we are about to produce uh, apps to help, help uh, consumers understand what are their rights and to understand how most efficiently ca uh, can they complain. And I think one aspect of the GDPR is also very interesting, namely that the DPAs, so the authorities, they now have to respond to complaints. They are legally obliged to respond to complaints. I think this is very important and people should know that because then I think they are much more motivated to make complaints. Um, yes, I think that, that's about it. Um, the general uh, awareness raising is certainly important, but I think we should not overburden consumers with kind of managing their own privacy in a way that is much too complex. I think we need to have uh, companies who change their mindset and to really respect, and we need to have choice, because for the time being we see it very much with Facebook. Uh, the German competition authority is looking into uh, Facebook from a comp competition point because it's a dominant position that this a company has and there is no real choice in the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isabella De Monte. Thank you very much, Chair. I should like to put a question as pertains to consumer rights and that would be broken down into several points. The question is for Lord Richard Allen. The question I would like to put to him is when it comes to fake news, and fake accounts. Why would you have such a banal approach? Wouldn't it be better to have some sort of a code that would be sent to a cellular telephone uh, telephone number for the to the user for a second verification after 2011? Have you received any news of this type of dissemination of uh, illegally disseminated data? And what is the communication process within Facebook? How did you approach this? What kind of measures have you undertaken? Did the Irish authorities do anything to prevent this type of illegal dissemination of, of data? Thank you. Thank you for those questions. So um, firstly, on uh, verification of accounts, so, so we do use mobile phone codes as a second authentication factor for log on to accounts. Uh, we don't currently require, um, if you like, uh, for registration, we don't require additional real names, uh, real identity information, except, as my colleague explained earlier, where we have a question mark about an account. So if it's been reported to us as potentially a fake or fraudulent account, at that point we may ask for information. Um, we can send you more information on, on how these different systems work, but I say where we use a, a SMS code is is, for example, if someone tried to log on to your account from a strange location, uh, is to prevent that kind of access, um, inappropriate access to the account rather than verification of identity. But as I say, it's an, uh, we're very open to that discussion, but I think there will be people on the uh, other side of the argument who say it'd be inappropriate for us to, to be collecting more information. Indeed, when we ask for telephone numbers, some people also uh, get upset by that. Um, it, in terms of the process after 2011, it, again, there are two ways that I see that regulators can work with a regulated entity like ours. One is essentially wait until you mess up and then come in and prosecute you, uh, and that's a perfectly reasonable model. The other model is more of an interactive model where you say to people, I, you know, here's how I want you to get better, here's improvements I expect to see, and I'm going to come back and reevaluate. And it's that second model that 
we went through with the Irish Data Protection Commission. Uh, they came, they spent a lot of time at our offices in response to Max's uh, complaints. The, a humble Austrian law student put in complaints and they were taken very seriously and the Data Protection Commission spent a huge amount of time with us and we put hundreds of people on uh, working on these issues. They uh, suggested some changes, they were insufficient, they came back and suggested more. So that was the process, backwards and forwards. Thank you, Angelika Mliner. Thank you very much, um, Chair. And somehow we seem to have quite an Austrian presence here the whole afternoon. <laughs> it may be a coincidence or not. And I would actually like, like to take on board uh, what uh, Max Schrems uh, just said. Uh, it is uh, diametrical against what we heard the whole afternoon, that there were apparently no European data used uh, in uh, the Cambridge Analytica case. And what uh, you, Mr. Schrems, just said, I mean, you... It's, it's obvious that it was, uh, I mean, they cannot claim that this has not been uh, the case. And I would like to put this question forward to you, um, Lord Richard Allen. I mean, how do you respond to this? Because, I mean, you have been present the whole afternoon and the official version of Facebook is that no European data has been used. And a further question, which is now a very concrete one. I mean, I'm a liberal and uh, my party takes uh, the GDPR and data protection very very seriously, and we found out that according to uh, the data protection experts, me as a politician, I'm not, uh, I mean, I cannot really use uh, WhatsApp anymore uh, because of the mining of uh, all the data that are on my, uh, on my telephone. So I would like to hear from you uh, if this is the case or not. Thank you. Um, so just very specifically, uh, uh, again, just clarify uh, the Cambridge Analytica situation. So, so um, there are broader issues around whether or not particular applications abuse data. And as we've explained, we're taking measures to try and identify and deal with that abuse. There's a very specific question about Cambridge Analytica, that they had a contract with this company, GSR, run by Alexander Kogan. The contract said, Alexander Kogan, please collect data of Americans to use in American political campaigns. And 97%, I think it was, of the people who installed Alexander Kogan's app were Americans, that's who they were targeting. And Dr. Kogan says he collected a load of data that included some European data, but the data he delivered to Cambridge Analytica was the Americans' data because that's all they wanted. So, th uh, and that's, that's what we've tried to explain. So if the, if the suggestion is Cambridge Analytica had a bunch of European data to use for campaigns in Europe, all we're saying is we don't have evidence of that, but we've said we need to go in and do the audit. We hope that's right, but we need to do the audit to confirm it. But the chain says they asked him for American data. He collected mostly American data, and he says he handed over American data. And then we need to confirm that. So I just want to be very transparent on that. On the WhatsApp question, that, that surprises me, and we, we should uh, uh, ask about that. Uh, you know, uh, we should talk about that. Our understanding is you know, WhatsApp is one of the most secure privacy protective applications that's out there. As people here, I'm sure, know, it, uh, it has end-to-end uh, -end encryption on by default. Uh, nobody at Facebook or WhatsApp can read the content of any of your messages uh, because of that end-to-end -end encryption. So we think it is a, a super... Uh, protective, super privacy protective uh, uh, tool. There may be some questions around contact lists and things that we can talk about, um, but in terms of the core data, the sensitive data, it is protected by a very strong encryption. My question goes to Max Schrems. Uh, Actually, I'm familiar with a model. First of all, using advertisement uh, in order uh, to earn revenue but the other relating uh, to a uh, copyright and advertising. These two systems have only become possible uh, through the use of the Internet. Uh, and, of course, the social media uh, operate in a tax-free way in this space, and television and media, of course, have to pay for this kind of advertising. Is there any kind of level playing field uh, we can contemplate in the future, and what of copyright uh, our journalists and artists, of course, are work and uh, need to be paid uh, for what they do. Currently, in many areas in the social media, people say no. So can, how can we safeguard the cultural identity of Europe by finding a way to bring these two systems uh, into a clear legal framework? 
that is question friendly, um, but I think I could probably add some elements to it that help to answer the question. Um, first of all, what we have to th rethink, and if you take anything away from this hearing, take this away. Um, online advertisement is not automatically data-driven. There's a lot of online advertisement does, that does not need personal data. For example, um, if you place something in the context of, of an ad, so you have um, car advertisement on a car page, you, that is targeted advertisement without touching personal data, and the industry tries to couple these two things into one thing, that online advertisement only exists if you have every bit of information about the person. If that would be true, we wouldn't have um, basically advertisement funded TV, for example, which is not at all targeted in any way. So um, we'll have to d dive a little bit deeper into that to kind of bust up this, this standard argument. Um, and then we have to see in an online advertising, we look actually into that a lot right now, and I don't have final answers on that, but um, in the online advertisement sphere, we then have to figure out who makes which amount of money. Um, I was talking to an Austrian um, publisher right now, and they said that in the micro-targeted advertisement sphere, they actually make less money than in a non-targeted advertisement sphere because the Googles and Facebooks that are necessary for that suck up most of the revenue. Um, he talked about up to 90% of payment of his customers to what comes out actually at the newspaper. And I think that is important also in direction of e-privacy and so on, that we have to look much deeper into these things and not just say if there are no cookies, then the publishers die. There is much more differentiation between these things. Um, and just because I still have 20 seconds left, um, because Richard said, for example, we need to debate the um, responsibility of third parties. We don't need to debate it. It's in Articles 26 and 28 of the GDPR, and it used to be in the old directive as well. There's a lot of things that we actually don't need to debate because the law already is around there anyway. So wonder about that. Next is Miriam Dali. Thank you, Chair. Um, and my question is directed to Mr. Schrams, because in the last um, years, your cases at the CG, CJ, you have defined the parameters of legislative interpretation when it comes also to our um, point of view regarding the European personal data. And if I can make a blanket statement, your court cases had had profound implications on EU law, its application and interpretation, and particularly in this House, we are extremely interested on future legislation. Now, at one point, you made a question. You said, will this change um, the with GDPR? And that is a concern that we share as well, because we share your concern whether GDPR is enough to stop this kind of exploitation of personal data. Um, and I would like to know, from your point of view as an activist and a lawyer in this regard, how do you look at the importance of the e-privacy reform, which is currently being blocked in Council, and how do you see the future legal framework in a way that can address and close any loopholes that currently exist? And what do you see as the main priorities that need to be in place? Um, thanks a lot for the, uh, for the question. Um, so I think for e-privacy, I actually took myself out of the debate because after years of GDPR, I was Brussels sick. <laughs> but I think um, it, it will fundamentally have to be in line with GDPR. I think I'm, I'm afraid of a system that would um, go to a default that data is shared that would then not be aligned with GDPR and possibly even be a problem with the charter itself. Um, so that is something I, in general, would like to say. On GDPR itself, I think it will be the first time we read actually the privacy policies of the big companies, not specifically Facebook, others as well. I was astonished how they fundamentally ignored a lot of the things that were debated in this house. For example, the first complaints we filed were on forced consent. It was the coupling that you are not allowed to couple consent to the product, was something that was debated up and down in this house forever. There was no debate in it. In every legal book, it repeats it over and over again. And the big companies simply ignored it. Facebook had a pop-up saying, you have to agree, otherwise you're not allowed to use the service anymore. Um, so I wonder, and that is something that probably Richard Allen would have to explain more, what the theory behind that is. This case is going to be lost. It's going to cost 4%, up to 4% of the worldwide turnover. It will be interesting if the data protection authorities really go through, or if the 4% become an international laughing stock if they don't. Um, but what is the theory behind it to blatantly ignore GDPR in many aspects? This is just one. Um, by whole industry, I have even a feeling that there is a pushback. 
not, let's not have the Europeans rule us because if the Europeans got through with it, probably the rest of the world does too. I don't know what the theory is behind it, but it was very interesting how far the ignorance goes in this case. If it's not just details, you know, where you have different types of interpretation and you just push the boundaries a bit, um, but it was blatant um, ignorance of the law. And that is, I think, kind of interesting because we hope that the 4% is going to do the trick. The small businesses, the, the, the individual businesses, are terrified about the 20 million, but apparently the 4% didn't really do the trick yet. I, I don't know, but that is my first impression on that, and um, that's the reason we bring cases, to also force the authorities to um, enforce the law and to have a possibility to then also appeal and so on. It will be interesting how different authorities res respond to that. I have a feeling that different member states will be responding very differently. <laughs> Now, uh, Reinhard Bütikofer. Lord Allen, you annoyed me by your charming cynicism. When you say there's often different opinion on concepts like informed consent, to me that translates into, well, even if we know we did break the law, we can afford to pay expensive lawyers. So for that reason, I don't want to ask you a question. I want to ask Mrs. Pachel uh, to go more deeply into the um, issues that you raised in the context of collective redress uh, on platform accountability and other measures. Are topics like algorithm watch or algorithm ethics rules part of what you would advise us to go for or where would you put the priorities? Thank you very much. Uh, maybe just to separate. So collective redress, I think there is one thing that must be very clear. The GDPR does not allow for collective redress. This is a myth that is always popping up here and there again. So that is not included in the GDPR. The GDPR only leaves the member state a choice that they can mandate um, um, organizations that protect uh, data subjects' rights uh, to do actions, uh, to do injunctions, to stop illegal behavior, but only if these organizations are individually mandated by a consumer or by the data subject, they could go for compensation. So GDPR does not provide that. But the new consumer deal, which has been proposed by the European Commission in April, which is a, a consumer protection measures, includes also collective redress for data protection breaches. So that is why I said it's very important that this collective redress uh, instrument would be as soon as possible adopted by the legislators in order to really ensure that we have something concrete to do in relation to um, personal data breaches that are on a massive scale because only four member states currently provide for such tools. This is why I mentioned four consumer organizations in the case of Facebook. They have gone to court today or will do so in the coming days, but the rest of Europe doesn't have this instrument. So this is about collective redress. Then about algorithms. Well, I think this is something which really is a very important uh, question that also uh, is very relevant for the GDPR, particularly when it comes to what algorithms are increasingly used for, also to, for uh, automated decision-making and artificial intelligence-sponsored decision-making. And one of the core things that we, I think we will have to explore also in terms of enforcement and interpretation is the question what consumers have as rights if there is an automated decision taken uh, that you have access to certain things based on the personal data that have been used to make this decision whether you're excluded from something or not. And the GDPR says that you have a right to explanation uh, and that you have a right um, to not accept the, um, the decision. So, but there is also some uncertainty, so this is certainly something that we also want to have a clear interpretation by the courts about that and by the DPAs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Madi Delbo. The floor is yours, Madi. Uh, thank you. Well, I will also turn to Madame uh, Pachel, uh, because when I, I, this is, I assisted to two parts of this uh, hearing, and I have to say, I, what is the use of uh, putting questions to Facebook? Because uh, uh, there is no, no news uh, and everything is okay. And on the other hand, when I look at the body language of the people sitting 
on this side, uh, I have the impression that what you tell us is not true at all. So I think we have no legislation which is new, and hopefully our agencies, our data protection agency, will have the strength to enforce uh, this uh, legislation. This is a challenge uh, we have to face, and especially the... Uh, the harmonization and harmonized approach between, uh, between member states, which is the biggest challenge. And I think the 4%, uh, the threat of 4% is maybe sufficient, and another threat could be the collective redress. Uh, so, but my question then goes to, well, data protections in the scope of, uh, of the proposal of the Commission. But um, uh, how, how can we evaluate the, the moral damage? Because this is, this is a big issue. We, we speak about financial damage, but what about the moral damage? So how do you see this, uh, this point? I was too long, sorry. Thank you very much. I think this is really one of the core questions, and I'm afraid I don't have a ready-made answer to it. But I think it's very important to say that the GDPR acknowledges that there is material and non-material harm from the infringement of data. So the legal basis to ask for compensation for data subjects is given. That's the first point. Uh, so that is across the European Union. Then the second point is we know that um, the uh, value of data is something where we don't have any standards, we don't have any uh, uh, very um, clear, uh, I would say, case law on that, but maybe Max uh, can complement that. Um, and I think we will have to see what, uh, what um, the court um, will, for example, decide when our member organizations have now brought this case. They have actually asked for 200 euro per data subject in the Cambridge uh, Analytica case, but also expanded it to all Facebook users, as I explained before. So this is just um, one reference that they have taken. But I think it must be clear that it's not only about economic damage, which will be very hard to evidence in many cases, but there must be also uh, a compensation for the non-economic uh, uh, harm. Thank you. If I may jump in for a second, we had the Austrian Supreme Court, for example, 750 euros for one wrong entry in a credit ranking database, and it went up in, in, in Canada that has a European-style privacy policy, uh, privacy law that goes up to 20,000 Canadian dollars. Um, so that is, it's going to be, a, it's going to be decided by the courts in the end. But I think the 200 is probably the very lowest level that we can possibly think of. And if you then multiply that with a million people that um, are affected, this goes actually sometimes beyond the 4% which is going to be interesting. So thank you. Uh, Cornelia Ernst. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to put my question to Max Schrems. And there have been lots of grievances and disputes. Some of the efforts uh, uh, were successful. Some were very enthusiastic, no doubt about it. But uh, now I'm worried about the question of the avenues uh, for making grievances uh, and a trust in the authorities. And what is Facebook actually doing in order to win over uh, the confidence of people like Max Schrems? A rather important point, I would think, uh, because it is a, a grievance, uh, a complaint uh, uh, for a violation of uh, privacy and a breach of data protection. And then what of the supervisory authorities? To what extent are they up to the task? Uh, are the control efforts sufficient? Uh, do they work uh, and uh, where don't they? And then a question very briefly from my liberal colleagues. Uh, it, it should be raised on WhatsApp. Well, of course, there's the question of the big uh, data security uh, gaps uh, in WhatsApp, and perhaps others can address that. Um, to start from the back, basically for WhatsApp, the issue is that the metadata is basically sold on, moved on, however you call it, um, to Facebook. And that is the fundamental problem, and unfortunately this was not answered before, and I cannot give you any further answer than right now I think it would be legal to use it as well, which is a fundamental problem for, for a lot, many companies, like right now I use Signal or something. Um, secondly, for the authorities, we, I think now with GDPR the authorities do have the tools. They have the powers to investigate, they do have the powers to um, have the penalties and so on. The big question is probably not the law, the big question is the culture in privacy. I came into privacy as a normal lawyer that expects that someone that parks in the wrong spot is getting a ticket. 
if you're suddenly in a privacy world, no one gets a ticket for whatever you want to do. And this is a cultural issue we have in the privacy bubble that started in the 80s, that this was kind of a soft law, if you want to comply, it's nice kind of thing. And I think the fundamental question we'll have to see, and that's a matter of the next two or three years, is if the authorities in Europe develop a enforcement culture like the banking sector, like any other sector we know, um, even you know traffic tickets, or if they stay in this kind of old style procedure. And it's probably different in different member states and it's gonna be very interesting to see that trend and we'll push in that direction. Um, lastly, what Facebook needs to do to be compliant, I think actually I would say 90 to 95% of the processing operations are legal anyways. Um, most of what they do is okay and, and necessary for the product they provide and so on. And in all the complaints we filed, but one, we actually always said, how can you do this privacy compliant? It's not that hard. Um, the fundamental problem is that we have, again, I think a cultural clash between a U.S. approach to privacy that's basically following California law and different reasons, um, and a European approach that fundamentally has different structures. And um, they want to have a one-size-fits-all system, and I think that's where the conflict comes up. Um, and I think even in the, in the advertisement sphere, you could solve a lot of the issues. Probably Facebook would be a little bit less, less rich, but I think we could, could all live with that as well. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my question really goes to Lord Allen. I'm interested in cooperation. Um, the EU data protection authorities and um, the Irish um, setup. Could you make comparisons between those two things? So, <clears throat> to clarify that we've made, again, I hope, some positive uh, developments over recent uh, um, months and years. As part of our GDPR compliance work, we actually went through an extensive program of engaging with a very broad range of European data protection agencies. So, uh, if in the past it seemed like we were only really engaging with the Irish uh, as our lead regulator under the directive, we now actually are engaging uh, much more frequently with a very broad range of, of DPAs um, across, the, across the union. Uh, we've also appointed a very senior individual as our data protection officer, uh, Stephen Debman, who was actually formerly chief privacy officer at Vodafone before he came to Facebook. And again, his role, uh, he's building up an office under the GDPR of DPO that's a serious office, and uh, a large part of his role will be to engage with data protection authorities. So again, I... I I don't want to be in the position where I am defending uh, everything we've done in the past. There have been some valid criticisms. There are criticisms where we do disagree, and uh, that isn't meant to be charming cynicism. There are different interpretations of the law, uh, and some court cases that we fought we've won and some we've lost. So sometimes we were right and sometimes we were wrong. Um, but we are very committed to GDPR compliance. We're very committed to uh, active engagement with data protection authorities. I would love to be able to close uh, Max Schrems's last gap of 5 to 10%. Uh, that would make life a lot easier for us as well if uh, 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 we managed to get to the point where we've made him happy. So I think that is a, a stretch goal we can all set for ourselves. Is Isabella again. Thank you. Torno su Lord. Lord Allen, che prima non mi ha convinto, devo dire, perché se... Thank you. I must say, listen to Lord Allen, I'm not entirely convinced. If you were really trying to address fake accounts, you'd have to do something more um, serious and businesslike. Um, having a code of um, conduct would be, um, in other words, a code sent to people's cells, to their mobile, uh, then that would be one way of doing that because anything else is really not going to uh, produce the, the, those results. Now, in um, uh, privacy regulations, my question is, what is was the legal base? And um, when it comes to uh, the policy, it talks about legitimate interest. What is legitimate? Is it to use um, data for a profit or something else? So, so just on, on uh, the fake accounts, Again, I think I've tried to indicate that I think this is a really um, open area for discussion. There is a broad principle, again, in GDPR of data minimization. We, are, we have not been persuaded to date that the collection of significant of extra amounts of sensitive information uh, uh, to, in order to verify someone's identity will 
be justified, but we understand in a number of EU member states and elsewhere, this is an open issue for discussion. And, and as I, I think that's the test that should be applied. Uh, our understanding at the moment is where we have significant doubts about someone's identity, um, such that uh, uh, we do think it's a fake account. Under those circumstances, requesting additional information would be justified, but to request additional information from all of the other users of Facebook would not be. Now, again, that debate is open and it may change over time and maybe countries will legislate, as was suggested earlier, for a country like Estonia with digital ID, maybe they will want to legislate and we will respond if they do. So I, say, I don't want to sound... Uh, I mean, we worry about this problem, but we need to balance those security interests against, let's say, the privacy interest of not collecting more information than is uh, strictly necessary. Um, on, on legitimate interests, I mean, we regard that as, I say, it's, it's the things we need to do in order to deliver the service to an individual. Um, and part of that is the activity that we have to do, as my colleague explained earlier, in order to fund the service and make sure it is available to people. So we don't see that you can separate that out. We do believe you can separate out specifically data collected uh, on third-party sites, and that is subject to a consent requirement. But we do believe, and this will no doubt get tested thanks to uh, Max's action and others, but we believe as, as of right now that it is appropriate and entirely consistent with the GDPR to put together the core functions of a social network and the core activities associated with being able to deliver that social network to an individual. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, a long afternoon come, is coming to its end. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank you for, for being so disciplined and, and following the rules. Uh, I also want to thank the interpreters, and I want to assure that we really evaluate and appreciate uh, your work, and, and we are on your side. So thank you very much. Uh, I just want to, to remind you that the next meeting uh, will take place in Strasbourg uh, on the 2nd of July. Uh, we have already confirmation by Mr. King, Mrs. Jourova, Mr. Ansip, Vice President Timmermans and Mrs. Westager are still uh, pending, but we, we also hope that they will attend because uh, the respect for, uh, for European law and fundamental rights is essential for us. And they also we also expect that uh, Mrs. Sheryl Sandberg uh, will take part uh, at this meeting. This is not confirmed yet, but uh, we are sure that she knows that this is uh, very important uh, to uh, appear at the meeting of this committee. So next hearing on the, on the 2nd of July. And uh, for the LIBE members, there is a meeting on the 28th of June. It has still to be confirmed, and we have then our normal meetings on the 2nd, the 9th, and the 10th uh, of July in Strasbourg or in Brussels. So thank you very much. The meeting is closed. Have a nice evening. The interpreters, we have reached.